Hey guys, welcome back to the story. This will be a story where Naruto was trained by Orochimaru? Jiraiya and Sanade were supposed to be the ones to watch over Naruto. What if that responsibility fell to Orochimaru instead? How will this affect both of them, and others? How will it affect Kanoa? If you like this story, don't forget to share it with your friends. Also smash that like button and subscribe. Now for the story. Today was October 11th, the day after the QB no Kitsune attacked Kanahagakur, and things weren't going well for those inside the village. Especially for the formerly retired newly reappointed village leader, Haruzan Saratobi, who was sequestered in his regained office with an upset blonde infant boy resting in a basket with a blanket. I can't believe it. Do they really have that little faith in Minato's skill or humanity? Is something wrong, Sensei? An almost eerie but not unconcerned voice asked from behind him. Aorochimaru, it's good you came by. The elder Hokage said as he opened the window and let his pale student inside, who was dressed as a normal jounin. And yes, something is indeed wrong. But first, do you think you can reach Jiraiya or Sanade really soon? Orochimaru shook his head. Sorry. You know Jiraiya is too wrapped up in his spine network to just come here all of a sudden. And need I say anything about Sanade? At least try. Tell them they've got a new responsibility that requires they return here ASAP. The snake Sanin sighed. I can try, but forgive me if I don't have the best confidence in what my teammates will do about it. But before I even try to, tell me what the new responsibility is first. Saratobi nodded, knowing it would be pointless for Orochimaru to explain something to the others he himself didn't know anything about. All right. You see that young boy? He pointed to the sleeping infant. Orochimaru nodded. That's Minato's son, Naruto. Hmm. Naruto Namakase. I'm assuming it means maelstrom, not fish paste cake, right? Correct. But he won't be called Namakase. He'll have his mother's maiden name Uzumaki instead. Orochimaru blinked. What for? Well, in the last war, Minato killed off a large number of IWA ninja as if it was nothing. And they're very angry at the humiliation they've received for it. If IWA knew Minato had a living relative, they may seek out his blood and go to extreme measures for it. We can't afford to risk such an attack now or in the foreseeable future, so if his name is different neither him or the village will be in trouble for it. Sounds good on the surface. But are you going to keep this a secret from everyone in Kanoha too? Saratobi nodded. Yes. People can't reveal a secret they don't know. So until he's the proper age, he and everyone else must remain ignorant of his heritage. Him too? Why? Orochimaru asked, not seeing the logic. Kids tend to brag about themselves or their families to sound important amongst other kids. If he's ignorant too, then he can't draw too much attention to himself. Saratobi explained. So Minato's son will have to live like a normal person? Who's going to raise him? Minato and Kushino listed Jiraiya and Tsunade as the child's godparents. Orochimaru looked surprised. Really? Why? Because they both knew and trusted your teammates Orochimaru. It wasn't personal. Oh, I know that. And I already have a godchild. Remember Daisuke Midarashi? Orochimaru asked. Saratobi nodded, having seen the pale Sanin being friends with the name Jounin and his family. Sadly, he and his wife died yesterday but they entrusted me with caring for their daughter in such an event. That's good, and Minato thought Jiraiya and Sanade would be good for Naruto. If you can ask them to come here, that would be best. Orochimaru sighed. I can try Sensei, but remember, I don't have confidence they'll cooperate. I'll be as quick as I can, but while I'm gone, can you watch over Anko-chan for me, please? Saratobi nodded, not seeing a problem with supervising a six-year-old for a bit. He could make some ninjas watch over her as a D-rank mission if he needed to focus elsewhere. Orochimaru then left the building and then the village to find his teammates. They were good at hiding from those looking for them, but since he was their teammate, he would have an easier time than others. But that didn't guarantee anything. Three days later Orochimaru returned to the Hokage Tower, empty-handed and alone. The first thing he saw when he answered were a bunch of irritated civilians and even a few ninjas too. One of them, a ninja wearing his attire over his left eye, approached him. Ah, one of the Sanin is here. Perhaps you could make Hokage-sama sensible again. Sensible? Orochimaru asked, beyond confused. If there was one thing the so-called professor wasn't, it was insensible. Yeah, he's been hiding up in his office for over a day and being foolish by preventing us from doing our duty. Orochimaru didn't like any of this, and even less when murmurs from the gathered people said things like kill and demon. As far as he knew, the QB had already been taken care of, so what was all the commotion about? He didn't say anything, just walked past them. 
The group let him pass with pleasure, figuring he was going to take care of the problem himself. Orochimaru stopped in front of the door, well aware there had to be a seal to prevent entry. So he summoned a snake and had it slip into the vents that led into the room. Come in Orochimaru. I'm glad you're back. Saratobi called out after three minutes, knowing only one person would gain his attention with a snake that knew not to attack. The seal briefly gave out and Orochimaru entered, closing the door quickly so the seal could reactivate before anyone took the opportunity to barge in. As soon as he entered, a young girl with long, loose purple hair barreled into him. Orokiji-san, thank Kami you're back. She was clearly crying. What's wrong, Anko-chan? He asked the sobbing child. He noticed the crib next to the desk and the infant inside was asleep but didn't look comfortable. And now he could see whisker marks on the boy's face. So many bad people were here, trying to hurt the baby. They said so many bad things about him. They tried to hurt me too. Orochimaru's eyes widened and he gave his old teacher a look that said, please tell me this is not true. Saratobi's sigh and closing his eyes did nothing to comfort his student. I'm afraid it's true. Once the council learned what had transpired with Naruto, they ordered his immediate execution. The civilians took the bait almost completely, and even some of the shinobi have too. Why the hell would they order that? Orochimaru all but shouted, momentarily forgetting he had a child beside him. Well, Minato got rid of the QB by sealing it away inside Naruto, at the cost of his life. I told them this so they'd know not to be afraid of a repeat attack by the beast, and that the child should be considered a hero for bearing such a burden, but right away they craved his blood. Apparently, they either believe the infant is simply the fox turned into a helpless child, or Minato did this specifically so the child could be killed thus killing the fox with it. Orochimaru wanted to throw up. Once in a while, he had curious thoughts that others could consider vile, but this was barbaric. So the council that has always worked with Minato actually believes that he would wish a newborn to die just to solve a problem? And if not that, that he was powerful enough to change the great fox demon into a human, but not strong enough to actually kill it? With all due respect, Sensei, my snakes have eaten things smarter than that. I've tried telling them the same, but they just can't see any other possibility. A few ninja have already tried to kill him at their beckoning, one being Minato's own student, claiming that's what Minato would have done if the demon hadn't killed him. If this keeps up, my hair is going to go gray faster. I've kept him here since then, and Anko-chan's been adamant about protecting him too since she's been here. For the first time, Saratobi smiled. You should be proud of her. She took a kanai to the shoulder to protect him. Orochimaru looked down at his godchild again and saw her tenderly touch her right shoulder. With the shirt in the way, he couldn't see the bandage around it, but didn't need to. He bent down and hugged his friend's daughter. Good girl, Anko-chan. And at least you didn't get hurt worse. Orochimaru, any news regarding Jiraiya and Tsunade? Saratobi asked. The snake Sanin tore himself away from the little girl. Sadly no, Sensei. I couldn't locate either. I checked all the nearest hot spring resorts, casinos and bars, but got nothing. I might have searched more, but my gut told me to get back here. And I'm glad I did. Saratobi took a puff from his pipe. This is bad. If we can't get at least one of those two back here soon, Naruto might not last much longer. Then I'll take him in for now. Saratobi blinked but didn't look surprised or objected. But don't you already have Anko-chan to watch over? And you were never officially declared a possible guardian for Naruto. If two Sanins aren't available, then who better than the one that is? Good point. The Sandame agreed. But still, won't having two children interfere with your work? Orochimaru tended to work with the ninja R&D division like the Naras and Akimikis when he wasn't on missions, hoping to find ways to give their shinobi advantages over others. By now some rather unscrupulous ideas and theories had come to mind for him, and he was half willing to try them out to see if they could work. No more than one would. Besides, it won't be permanent. Sonate may decide she's gone off on her own long enough soon and decide to settle down back here. And sooner or later Jiraiya has to come back to tell you the results of his snooping. I can watch him in the meantime. After all, I don't see anyone else volunteering that you know won't try to kill him. Saratobi couldn't argue that point. Very well, Orochimaru. I'll allow you to be Naruto's guardian and caretaker until such time that his designated godparents can do the job instead. Also, I'm creating a few laws for Naruto's protection. No one will be allowed to talk about sealing away the QB or Naruto's connection to it. So none of the younger generation will be taught anything except that the QB was beaten by the Yandame, with the exception of Anko-chan here for obvious reasons. This way, maybe he can live a normal life among his peers. That requires a lot of faith in the people of this village, Sensei. 
and if what I saw outside is any sign, this boy's still going to have a hard time fitting in. Especially if the parents tell their children to stay away from him. Orochimaru commented. We'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it and hope he can gain some friends that'll see him for him. Saratobi said, not sounding as confident as he wanted to, which Orochimaru easily noticed. With nothing else to say, Orochimaru thanked his teacher, grabbed Naruto and Anko, and left the building through the window. No way he was going to walk through that crowd again holding the whiskered infant. He took the two to his small modest home and set up a futon and crib in his guest room. Sorry, but you two will have to share a room for a little bit. Anko nodded. That's okay, Orokiji-san. I've been sleeping in the office with him and the old man since you left. You aren't going away again so soon, are you? Orochimaru shook his head. No, not until things here get settled for you two. I need to see just how many are going to try to hurt him, and you just because you know him. Again, protecting him was a very good thing to do. Anko smiled. He's cute, especially with those whiskers. I guess he is. I hope that's not the only reason you helped him. Anko shook her head. Nope. I thought he might be able to be that little brother I always wanted. And if he's staying here with me, he really is. Orochimaru smiled. I guess you're right. And as the big sister, you need to be there to keep him safe if someone tries that again. Try not to get yourself killed though, and get me if things get ugly. Okay. I sure hope this works out until those two get here. Orochimaru thought. Two years have passed since Naruto was born, and they hadn't been pleasant years for him. Even though he was too young to ever remember all of this time, his foster family would never forget it. Everything that happened or almost happened to Naruto, they either softened or took in his place, and while it hurt, in a way it brought them all closer. Sonade still had not come back to the village or been confirmed seen in that time. Jiraiya had come back a few times to make his reports but never stayed long enough to actually do anything about his responsibility to Naruto, even see him. At times Orochimaru seriously wondered if the Peeping Tom was even aware of it or Naruto. Saratobi told him otherwise though a few months ago. I managed to inform him about Minato's son being alive and reminded him of his duty. The Sandame had explained to his one remaining student. He says he can't simply stop what he's doing since it would take too long to get restarted once he had free time again, and he's onto something potentially vital to Kanoa's safety. He doesn't like this, but feels it's best to just let things stay as they are for now. It wasn't that Orochimaru really minded having to care for Naruto, although the frequent feedings and diaper changes in the beginning had been a hassle. Outside that, he liked the boy. The sheer playful innocence of the child was a welcome change to having to deal with shinobi matters all day long, with people that long ago forgot what innocence was. And the youthful curiosity reminded him why he got into R&D in the first place, to help young ninja improve their chances of returning home alive. Over time the concept of lengthening a ninja's lifespan sounded more tempting, and if he ever figured out a promising way, he might try it out. But now it wouldn't be just for his own benefit. Naruto and Anko both helped the pale Sanin a lot in his personal life. Because of his snake-like appearance and albino-ish complexion, Orochimaru never really had much of a social or romantic life. All of his friends were business friends he occasionally hung out with when off-duty, like his teammates or Anko's parents. So he had basically given up on love or having a family of his own long ago. Having Anko and Naruto around filled the void he figured he'd just tolerate for the rest of his life and in a way he considered them the children he never had. Anko still called him Jazan though, and Naruto would too when he saw him. One time as a one-year-old he hissed instead, making both Orochimaru and Anko laugh a lot. Anko missed her parents but liked her foster uncle and brother. She was aware him being with them wasn't intended to be permanent, but decided Naruto was going to be her brother no matter what. She proved it by taking several fists and cuts for defending him, or just by being associated with him. The first few were adults which were arrested for child endangerment, but after the rest learned they encouraged their children. Many were reluctant, especially those that knew Anko before, but not all so she became victimized all over again. Her only response, better me than Otuto. Orochimaru was livid about all this. Even more so when one of the babysitters early on tried to kill them both. Anko had to use a kitchen knife to cut the sitter's Achilles tendon before they could do worse than put a few bruises on them both. The sitter tried to press charges, but since Saratobi handled the case, the sitter had a restraining order against the residents and occupants since then and community service. After that, he never left them with anyone without a shadow clone or a snake summon nearby. He simply couldn't trust anyone to be near them without him. At the moment, Anko, who was eight years old now, was practicing out in her house's backyard while Naruto took a nap inside their room. 
The two still shared a room, which made it easier for her to defend him if anything should happen. Anko was throwing some kanais at human-shaped boards to improve her aim for certain spots, a point Orochimaru told her was vital to perfect for her. After she threw them, her personal summons Kogayaku, which Orochimaru had arranged to be permanently summoned to defend the girl until she was older, would retrieve them for her. Naruto had one too, a snake called Sango that was watching him like a guard dog at the moment. Both snakes were venomous and could become as large as boas if they had to. The only way to tell them apart was Kogayaku was purple with red spots down her back and Sango was orange with black streaks. Naruto was probably the only toddler in the world that wasn't afraid of a snake. Kogayaku had brought Anko her weapons back when she tensed up. Something wrong. Do you hear that buzz? Anko quietly asked. Kogayaku listened. Luckily as a summon she had some skills normal snakes didn't, such as being able to hear like humans could rather than just vibrations through the ground. Yeah, I do. Sounds like bees or something. Soon they both noticed a large swarm of dangerous sounding small insects flying towards their house and settling around the closed window of the kids' room. They couldn't get in thanks to a few rudimentary seals Orochimaru knew, but they weren't going to stop trying. Anko and Kogayaku almost hid until they saw the bugs weren't after them, just Naruto obviously. Problem was there was nothing either of them could do about it, except one possibility. Kogayaku saw Anko pull out her emergency paper bomb kanai and stopped her before she could use it. No don't. It won't get rid of all of them, and you'll just make it easier for them to get inside. What should I do then? Before the purple snake could answer, a mysterious person dressed like an Unbu agent came up behind them and knocked Anko out. Kogayaka grew to the size of a python and constricted herself around the intruder, only for him to replace himself with a log. With only one thing left to do, Kogayaka dragged Anko into his safe spot outside the house, got smaller, and darted to Orochimaru's office as fast as she could. Orochimaru, one of the heads of Kanoa's R&D department, was going over some proposals for funds to explore researching new ideas and why they were advisable. Many were, but they had to be prioritized first. Hmm. I've got requests for extra protein supplements to the Akimichis. Well, they may have to use their own funds if possible. This guy wants to see if one can find a way to siphon off another's chakra like a parasite. Handy, but maybe risky. This guy wants to see what would happen if cells from someone with a kekiai jinkai were introduced into the body of someone without one. Hmm. I'm intrigued. And this guy, oh, well, Amachi wants to try new terrain to test possible physical adaptability. Claims to be very promising. Hmm. Before Orochimaru could make a decision on anything, Kogayaka came in through the air duct. Orochimaru-sama. Danger at the house. He took the snake into his hands and shoo shined away without a word. When he showed up in front, he immediately rushed inside and heard hissing coming from the kid's room. He went in to see Naruto sleeping, ignorant of the trouble, but Sango was large and looking outside. Kogayaku left Orochimaru to go check on Anko. Sango, what happened? A large swarm of bugs, acting like they were on a mission, tried to get in. And some Unbo knocked Anko chan out but got away before Kogayakane-san could punish them. Sounds like an aburame, but why would they do this? They've never had a problem with us before? Apparently one does. The orange snake stated hastily. Orochimaru frowned. I'm bringing this up to the Hokage. Saratobi knew what to expect when his pale student entered his office. Well, what happened now, Orochimaru? Sensei, things are getting out of hand. The clans are now starting to act out against Naruto. They've kept their distance, probably to avoid offending me, but now a confirmed attack from an aburame shows this situation isn't getting better. A confirmed attack? How many ninjas use insect swarms? Orochimaru sarcastically asked. I see. The Sandame responded. But can you confirm the individual? No, I cannot. But I know this won't be the last time. Sensei, I know you've done what you can for the boy, but... I'm seriously reconsidering whether or not this is the best environment for him. For either of them. Saratobi blinked. Orochimaru, that can't be done. It's not safe for them out there. It's not safe for them in here either. If anything, it's worse. Orochimaru shouted angrily. You've put in so much effort to keep Naruto from having enemies outside the village, but you keep forgetting he has them inside it too. I forget nothing Orochimaru. Saratobi countered sternly. I am not oblivious to the torment that has been going on at your household. Have you forgotten that all those arrested have suffered for their crimes? You have helped, but those not arrested just find new ways to hurt them. Usually through their own children. Are you aware that none of the parents will let their kids play with Anko-chan anymore? Just because she's the demon's sister? 
She used to have a whole network of friends. Now I can count the number of kids that still dare to talk to her on one hand. And do you honestly think Naruto will be in a better situation when he's older? Does this sound like a healthy environment for them? No, but I can't very well tell parents how to raise their children nor the children to disobey their parents. Orochimaru folded his arms. Not only that, but many of the merchants are trying things too. Anko-chan can barely buy anything unless I'm right there with her since they won't dare overcharge or deny me. And I know the situation won't be any different when Naruto's older. You think it's good for them to be in a town that denies them fair prices or maybe the right to shop even if they can pay? Saratobi didn't answer, mostly because he knew his student had more to say. Sensei, I've gone to a lot of trouble to ensure the safety of those two. I even have snakes around them 24 to 7, and I could only do that by giving Manda four living scarifices, which I got thanks to your order. Saratobi nodded in recollection. For Anbu were found guilty of trying to murder the two children by arson, and he allowed Orochimaru to execute the punishment. While brutal, at least some good came out of it in the form of snake guardians. Sensei, I'm seriously considering that this is not the best place for them to live. Orochimaru, your concern is admirable dash, Saratobi started. Spare me the bullcrap, Sensei. I know you're going to try to convince me they're better off here. Give me one good reason why I should let them stay here any longer rather than just take them away. Simple. Saratobi stated. Minato sacrificed his life so his son could protect this village. If you take him away from it, it will make his sacrifice meaningless. If the villagers keep trying to kill him, it'll have the same results. Orochimaru countered. If Minato could speak to you right now, what would he say? I don't know. Maybe he'd agree with you. Maybe he wouldn't. The council and citizens here have been trying to speak for Minato so much since his death, I'm almost afraid to know. But consider this Orochimaru, you're only the acting guardian of Naruto. Jiraiya and Sanade are still the ones with majority say regarding his whereabouts and Jiraiya thinks that dash. Shut the heck up, sensei. Now Orochimaru looked pissed. How can you possibly have the nerve to say that? You actually expect me to believe that Jiraiya's opinion of Naruto's well-being outclasses mine, the one who has actually been raising the boy for the past two years? The man hasn't even seen Naruto in that time, and he's the one who knows best? He's not the one who's taken hits for the boy nor has he fed or clothed or sheltered him. Hell, sensei, you know as well as I do Anko-chan and I are the only ones who have any real claim to be the boy's family. Well, I can't argue that. But still, give the village another chance for the children to fit into. For my sake, if nothing else. Orochimaru sighed. Fine, sensei, I'll try to tolerate this a little more. But if nothing changes for the better, I will do something about it, with your permission or not. Saratobi slowly nodded in acceptance. Very well. Tell them, hi for me. Orochimaru nodded and then poofed away, revealing he had been a shadow clone the whole time. Guess he's getting even more protective of them both. Does that make him a mother hen snake? So no luck. Danzo asked from within his secret chamber. Sorry Danzo-sama, but the residence is better guarded than previously anticipated. Torian Aburame, a bug-wielding member of Root answered. Damn. I figured that a Sanin would make sure his abode would be secure, but apparently he did better than I thought. Danzo mumbled in his head. But I want that tool. Hmm. If I can't get it by force, maybe I'd have to try a different approach. A few days later, without attacks, Orochimaru had a visitor come to him at his office. Ah, Danzo-san. What brings you here today? Orochimaru had always tried to be civil to the crippled council member mainly because the Warhawk had always supported the R&D department to improve Shinobi abilities, but that didn't mean Orochimaru trusted him. After all, this guy had been the only member of the civilian council to not order Naruto's death, and Orochimaru did not believe the man was just being compassionate back then. Well, Orochimaru, I have a proposition for you. You see, I've heard from a colleague of mine that you're experimenting on the introduction of Kekiai Genkai into new hosts. And I've come a C-dash. Hold on a second. Orochimaru interrupted. A colleague told you? I haven't discussed that with anyone and I haven't even approved the start of the experiment. My source must have been the researcher to submit the request then. I was under the impression that it had already been approved. Danzo calmly answered. Orochimaru narrowed his eyes. What goes on here isn't meant to be discussed with those outside to keep our secrets safe. You of all people, Danzo, should know the value of keeping secrets. You have no idea how right you are. Danzo quickly thought. Well, back to what I was saying, I had chanced upon some stored DNA of the Shodai Hokage. And as you know, your teammate Tsunade Senju is the last known of that bloodline and it's dormant in females. 
and she's also reached the age where conception is almost impossible, if not already impossible. A very useful kekiai jinkai for us could be lost forever, unless we seek a new means to keep it going. Orochimaru thought it over. Well, it sounds reasonable, but what if the subject rejects the new DNA? That's what experiments are for. Even so, I have multiple fields to explore and I can't give funding to them all. Danzo smiled. Tell you what, I'll supply the funds for this project and we'll use the Mokutan as the trial run. If we can succeed in getting a successful user, then we can someday acquire indefinite amounts of Kekiai Jenkai for our village. And in return? Orochimaru asked. Nothing at the moment. How about an IOU? Orochimaru did not like the sound of that. An IOU to this man was like having one to the Yakuza. But the idea he was proposing sounded enticing. All right, we'll go forward with it. You'll have to supply us with about 3 million Rio up front though, and your IOU must be within reason. Danzo smiled like he got away with murder. Pleasure doing business with you, Orochimaru-san. Let's hope for the best. Another year went by and things sort of stabilized for the Orochi household. Attacks lessened but did not stop, and the civilians resorted to angry glares when they saw Naruto and Anko. Orochimaru had made it clear that any attacks would be returned just as badly to the attackers by himself personally, and Saratobi said he had the rights to. Anko lost more and more friends because of their parents' prejudices or peer pressure, so now she was down to two. The first was a girl named Karina Yuhi, whose parents were more open-minded to the Jinchuriki and his situation. The second was an orphan boy named Kabuto Yakushi, recently brought to the village after being found alone in a battlefield and didn't mind the kids either. Neither were as lively as Anko usually was, but they could keep up with her. Naruto himself didn't have too many friends. It was hard to win most parents didn't want to bring their children over. Generally speaking, if Naruto's secret didn't keep them away, his snake guardian scared them off without even trying. Sango didn't like that, but she was sworn to protect him, so she couldn't just leave him vulnerable. And it got tougher after the insect attack, since Orochimaru wouldn't let anyone from a clan enter his house without his personal approval and presence. So in short, only the Yamanaka, Nara, and Akimichi clan heads had their children come over because they trusted the Yandame's skills and hoped their kids wouldn't be afraid of snakes later on. The Hyuga would have if they were more open to mingle with others, and the Yuchi is deemed the whole issue unworthy of significance, their words. At the present time, a soon-to-be three-year-old Naruto was hanging out at the Yamanaka flower shop with a three-year-old Ino while Orochimaru and Anko were trying to find him a birthday present or two. Inoichi was watching the two kids have fun their own way in the back of the room while going over a newspaper and noticed nothing out of place. There were a few insects buzzing around, but that was normal for a place filled to the brim with flowers. But after a little bit the buzzing noise of insects got a little too loud to be normal and Inoichi got suspicious. The kids noticed it and got scared, looking to Inoichi to do something about it. He looked around sharply but saw nothing suspicious, but went for the cabinet and grabbed the pesticide to be sure. A large black swarm of insects massed together through the open windows and entered the unsealed building. Ino screamed and ran for her father. Naruto tried to as well, but the insects swiftly covered his body and started attacking him. He screamed and tried to sweat them all off, but fell to the floor and his movement slowed. Sango could do nothing but watch and hate herself for it. Something's not right. Those aren't normal aburame insects. Those just eat chakra, not sting and bite. These things are actually wounding Naruto. Inoichi thought, as horrified as he and his daughter looked. Ino tried to help sweat them off, but her father grabbed her hand. No, don't. Those bugs will hurt you too. Use the spray to chan. Ino pleaded. I can't now. Naruto would get poisoned too. Naruto screamed again and his body glowed a faint red. The insects backed off bit but didn't leave his body or stop entirely. Unable to take the pain anymore, Naruto did the one thing any child in his situation would do. He ran. He didn't know where he was going or what he'd do when he got there, but he had to just run. The Yamanakas followed. Think he might like this, Jazan? Anko asked as she pointed to a play sword on display in a window. Orochimaru was about to answer, but any answer died on his tongue when he heard a familiar scream down the street. Anko heard it too and lost interest in the question entirely. Both looked down the street in hopes they were wrong. They saw a young child running around with a swarm of bugs clinging to him. A few passerby would try to beat the bugs off him, but they moved off on their own just enough to reveal who the child was. Once people saw, they either looked the other way or kept beating him for a different reason. Orochimaru, Anko, and Kogayako rushed to help him. 
They were a little relieved when an Unbu agent dropped by the boy and did a fireball jutsu. The bugs fled off the boy leaving Naruto to take the brunt of the attack. Orochimaru and Anko were horrified by this, and even more so to see the Unbu didn't look repentant or even tempted to put out the flame. Although Orochimaru saw that last part more than Anko did. Orochimaru used a gentle wind jutsu to put out the flame while Anko yelled at the Unbu, crying in anger. You jerk. You missed. That depends on where I was aiming. Anko gasped and then began hitting the masked ninja's legs, to which he reacted by kicking her off. She was undaunted by this and tried to attack again, but he simply left the area, seeing no reason to stick around anymore. But not before Kogayaka managed to give him a painful bite on his right calf. Before the insects could attack again, Orochimaru used a fire jutsu on them as intended and they were completely incinerated. He looked at Naruto and was very pissed, but not at Naruto of Kaos. The blonde boy had second-degree burns almost all over his arms and face, with the clothed areas only bearing first-degree burns, and was breathing heavily. Otudo? Is he going to be okay, Jazan? Anko asked tearily, on the verge of hysteria. Orochimaru carefully picked him up. He will be. I know how to best help him. Anko-chan, get on my back. Kogayaku, go get Sango. The purple snake nodded and darted away while Anko got a hold of the snake's sand and shoulders. He then darted off to a safe place for them all. Some civilians started to wonder if maybe the one Sanin still in town had been pushed too far. That's it. I've had enough of this. Minato must be rolling around in his grave. Orochimaru angrily thought as he entered his house and placed Naruto down on the couch. The Kyuubi's chakra was already healing the young boy. And fortunately for him, he was unconscious by now. The two snakes entered the house a few moments later and got by the couch too. Anko, with tear-streaked cheeks and red eyes, hovered over her brother figure like a watchdog. Jazan, what's gonna happen to him? He'll be fine, Anko-chan. He's already healing and should be as good as new by tonight. What should we do about that bastard that burned him? Anko asked, sounding a little more angry now. Orochimaru never bothered to enforce appropriate language for the kids since they heard offensive things almost daily anyway. We'll see to him. And also whoever sent those bugs at him. That wasn't natural either. But first, I've got something bigger in mind. Anko blinked. Like what, Jazan? This has gone on for far too long. Saratobi sensei can't bargain his way out of this. I'm going to make sure this stops once and for all. The snake Sanin stated with hostility and venom, and maybe a little glee at the last idea. Anko smiled. Can I help? Absolutely. But we have to act tonight, and you can't tell a soul. He told her, to which she nodded. Good. Now go pack up everything you have. We're going on a little trip. How long? Long enough. Anko looked worried about having to maybe leave her home and remaining friends for who knows how long. But after looking at Naruto one more time, she knew it was a matter of time before that happened to her too. And Orochimaru had never let her wrong before. I'll be ready in a jiffy. She told him before heading for her room. It won't be that easy, Master Orochimaru. Kogayaka commented. Oh, I know that. That's why I'm going to put on a big show for Kanoha and do a little damage too. The pale Sanin replied. Like what? Sango asked. Well, let's just say Kanoha will learn what happens when you try to corner a viper. He told them with a sinister chuckle. And best of all, since that meeting with the Kumo representatives is tonight, few will be available to interfere in my little scheme. Night came over Kanoha, and it would be a night that shaped its future indefinitely. Most of the representatives of the clans were at a meeting with visitors from Kumo hoping to arrange an alliance of sorts. The streets were deserted as people went home to sleep with night Unbu making their rounds. Overall, nothing ominous or unexpected. Saratobi had called a brief break during the long discussion with the foreign ninjas so everyone could stretch their legs and use the restroom if needed. While he himself got a drink from a break room, an Unbu agent approached him. Hokage-sama, fire has just broke out at Orochimaru-sama's residence in the R&D department. Saratobi frowned. A oh, crap. This will end badly, I just know it. Thanks for alerting me. Tell my advisors and the clan heads I'm going to personally check this matter out and no decisions are to be confirmed without my presence. Hopefully this won't take too long. The old man then got into his combat out form and headed for Orochimaru's house, hoping to settle his student before he acted rash. Not that it wouldn't be uncalled for, he admitted. Saratobi arrived at the Orochi household to see it burning to the ground. The Unbu that arrived with him began immediately putting it out with water jutsus. Once the fire was gone, they salvaged through the wreckage for any bodies. Saratobi prayed they wouldn't find any. 
One of the Unbu captains came close to the elderly Hokage. Hokage-sama, there is little you can do here. Perhaps it would be more beneficial for you to investigate the other arson incident. So this is a confirmed arson? Saratobi asked, not that he doubted it, of course. Most likely, sir. Orochimaru-sama was a very skilled ninja, so this being just an accident is highly unlikely. My guess is someone with a few matches or something decided to act against the occupants and caught them off guard. Saratobi nodded, having come to the same conclusion. I'm sorry for everything, Orochimaru. Enko. Naruto. At least you're out of your misery now. He sighed, then thought of something else. Wait, if this was just a stroke of luck, it would be too much of a coincidence for Orochimaru's lab to be struck at the same time. Something's going on here. I will go check out the other scene as you suggested. Take all bodies to the morgue or infirmary, whichever is appropriate for them. Saratobi told the Unbu captain before heading off for the R&D building. Said Unbu returned to work with the others going through the wreckage. Find anything? No confirmed deaths yet, sir. A weasel mask Unbu told him. Good. Let's hope it stays that way, or Hokage-sama will not be happy. When Saratobi made it to the burning wing of the building, he didn't know what he expected to find. But he definitely didn't expect to find Orochimaru standing in the flames crying while all his work burned to ashes. Orochimaru, what is the meaning of this? Did you do this? The snake Sanin slowly turned to look at his mentor, eyes watering but as cold and hard as steel. No, Sensei, I have done nothing. It's Kanoa that has done all this. And maybe you by passive association too, but I won't hold you to it. What are you talking about? I should have done what I thought was best long ago. Your pleas be damned. But because I felt I owed you, I stayed and kept Naruto here. And now, he's gone. Saratobi paled. You don't mean. Orochimaru nodded. Another attack, this time a successful one. Asked the Yamanakas. They saw it too. Naruto was ambushed by some type of insect I've never seen before, making me think the Aburames have others besides their norms or someone else was framing them. Either way, that combined to someone setting my house on fire, Naruto didn't make it, and Anko-chan got caught in the flames. Not to mention, when all the civilians and even an Unbu wearing a pig mask saw him, it just added to his pain. I bet the Unbu started the fire since he used a fire jutsu on Naruto earlier today. Saratobi sighed feeling a wave of remorse and regret. Orochimaru, I'm sorry for your loss. Spare me the bullcrap sentiment, Sensei. I've warned you several times this could happen, and you always said no one would go that far. Well, guess what? They did, and my two godchildren are dead because you thought it was easier to not get involved more than you did. And I don't care what some legal form may say, Naruto was mine, and all my work for this village has been destroyed by someone else too. He spread his arms to better imply the fire going on around themselves. This is what Kanoha has come to? Trying to kill a child and claiming he didn't deserve to even be conceived? And attacking those close to him for spite? This is the Kanoha Minato died for? Naruto should not have had to suffer for this horrid place. Orochimaru. Saratobi was now worried about what his student would do in retaliation. Sensei, I'm going to take a page out of Sanade's book and tell them all to piss off. After tonight... Not even you can give me reason to stay here even until the sun rises. I'm wiping my hands off Kanoha as of now. Saratobi knew he couldn't stop his student, and deep down he couldn't fault him for taking this course of action. Where will you go? What will you do? For the first time in this entire discussion, Orochimaru grinned. People can't tell a secret they don't know. A sensei? If I don't know, I'll be forced to put you in the bingo book as a missing knee. Orochimaru scoffed. Like you did with Sonade? The slug Sanin and her apprentice were probably the only registered ninja under Kanoha that were not contained within the city and not classified as missing Ni. Jiraiya wasn't classified that way because he was gone regularly for business in Sanade's case. Just leisure or apathy, maybe both, but she wasn't listed in the book. Sanade is no threat to us. With you in this emotional state, I can't promise anything. Saratobi replied sternly. I will not ally myself with any enemy village sensei, but neither will I ally myself with this one anymore. So what are you going to do? Just wander around and wait to die. Oh, I'm in no hurry for death. Never have been. But I'll find something to do to occupy myself. But it's none of your business, Sensei. Now if you'll excuse me, I'll getting a little too hot in here. Orochimaru said before Shu shining away. Saratobi did the same and the building continued to burn until Unbu arrived to put it out. Before the meeting with Kumo could resume, Saratobi called the whole council together. Tonight, Naruto Uzumaki has been killed by some unknown arsonist. 
A few cheers from over half the council made him pause and flare up his KI to silence them. And because of that and the reaction I just witnessed, Orochimaru has cut all ties to the village. He can't do that. We need him here. A random civilian shouted. Saratobi glared some more. Maybe you should have thought of that before encouraging all that mistreatment amongst the kids in his care. Both of them are dead now because of idiots like you all. Why the hell should he remain here to keep working for such a village? Would you? At least my child isn't a monster. Another random member commented, ignoring the Hokage's glare. Irregardless of how you all may see the situation, Orochimaru sees it as the final straw for his patience. He has no reason to help us anymore, and I probably wouldn't be surprised if he decided to do something drastic later on. Feel proud of yourselves, for you've helped us lose a valuable shinobi and possibly made several people you know targets of his wrath. And for what? Because you can't let go of a grudge no matter who the victim is? What a shining example of good leadership. But enough of this, let's just finish this meeting and call it a night. They all followed his lead, but several were already celebrating in their heads over the reported death of a blonde whiskered boy. Did it work? Anko asked as her foster uncle came into view from her hiding spot, a bunker outside the city walls designed for civilian safety in invasion times. Like a charm, Orochimaru told her as he ruffled her hair. By tomorrow morning, everyone will think you and Naruto are dead and I left grieving. We can find somewhere to live with no one looking for you too. And I can train you both to fight back like Shinobi should. Anko smiled. She was glad for that. W. Chi Orochimaru told her they were going to leave their home and not come back. She was a little frightened. Especially if Tracker Ninja tried to find them. He told her he was going to stage their deaths. And that way no one would hunt them. Everyone had to think that. Even the Hokage. Or it wouldn't work. And apparently it did. No more bad people? Well... No more from Kanoha at least. There are still enemies outside, but they won't attack as much. Orochimaru-sama, is it true we can't go back? A young boy with white hair asked. Well, you could, but where would you go Kabuto-kun? Orochimaru found the boy in the lab before the fire had started to attract Saratobi. Apparently the boy had been the subject of a few experiences Danzo had been doing without Orochimaru's knowledge. He wasn't supposed to even be involved, but Danzo had his own agenda and damn those that didn't go along with it. He had been trying to create many Kekiai Jenkais, with just the Mokutan test being a cover front. According to the results Orochimaru saw tonight, most subjects dies, but two young boys and one girl survived. One was about Anko's age named Yamado, and he was a success in acquiring the Mokutan, and the only one at that. Kabuto had been the second boy, and the subject of better-than-normal healing experiments, and they seemed to work too. The girl had been Karinai, who had not been tested on yet but had been selected since she was Anko's friend. Her parents were killed two days ago, making her an orphan now. And according to the results, a second lab had been doing similar work under Danzo's orders, masked as Orochimaru's approval, in the land of the sea, being headed by a researcher Orochimaru knew named Amachi. And he had some successes too. Orochimaru, already unnerved by the horrible treatment done to Naruto and Anko, became even more upset when this was revealed to him. His work was being usurped from him under the guise of his own approval, making it look like it was all his idea. There might have been a time he would it, but he was in no mood for it now. So he took the kids to a safe place, went back and set fire to the lab to destroy his notes, ensuring no one else could misuse his work, and waited for Saratobi to show up and act his part. He lied about Naruto and Anko's death to ensure no one else would follow him, believing him to have left in grief rather than protecting the children. Back at the present, Orochimaru let everyone who had been hiding come back outside. If you want to go back Kabuto-kun you can, as long as you swear not to say a word about tonight. Same for you, Karinai-chan. The bespectacled boy sighed wearily. No, that's alright Orochimaru-sama. I don't have any family there so what do I have to go back to? Karinai tearily nodded. Yeah, me too. Where will we go? Anko asked. Kogayaka settled on her shoulders to hear this while Sango did the same with Naruto. Yamado looked at the snakes wide-eyed, afraid they would bite. First, we're going to settle some business in Land of the Sea with someone misusing my work. And then we'll go somewhere I know no one we can't trust will find us there. Where? Naruto asked. I'll tell you later. Not a good idea to say too much near here, and we should get out of here. Orochimaru answered. With no other words, he picked up Naruto and placed him on his back. Kogayaki got larger and let Anko and Karina ride her with Sango doing the same for Kabuto and Yamado. They started running or slithering away from Kanoha, 
not sure when or if they'd ever see that village again. Orochimaru also created several shadow clones and had them run in several directions with extra summon snakes to tag along, making it that much harder for anyone to find them. An hour later the kids had fallen asleep, and everyone on the move slowed down a little to not disturb them too much. Kogayaku stopped completely though, and turned her head around. Orochimaru, I smell someone coming up from behind. The pale Sanin placed Naruto on Sango's back, getting ready to fight. He went off to get rid of this potential threat, only to find a Kumo Nin running towards Land of Lightning. He would have done nothing about it, except he saw the burlap bag the Kumo Nin carried with something moving inside it trying to get out. Remembering the meeting that had been going on, he suspected something foul and intercepted the ninja. That had better not be what I think you have in there. None of your business, freak. The Kumo ninja told him bitterly. Orochimaru pulled out Kuzanagi and stabbed the man before he could get away. He then took the bag and opened it to find a bruised and crying little girl with white eyes. So, did you decide on your own to kidnap a child? Or were you ordered to? Screw you. The Kumo Nin answered, coughing up some blood. Orakamo kicked his head, snapping his neck, then held the crying hurt girl. Don't worry, you're safe now. I'm Orochimaru. What's your name? Hi, Hinata. Well, Hinata-chan, want me to have someone take you home? He asked, and got worried when she looked even more frightened and shook her head no fiercely. Why? What's wrong? Ev, everyone T, there, is bad. Okasan was good, but now gone. Everyone else hate me. Don't want to go back. Please don't make me. She broke down after that and wept into his chest. Orochimaru then noticed that some of the bruises weren't as fresh as others, meaning she had been hurt before the kidnapping. I can't believe it. It sounds like some of the Hugo like to beat up their own rather than just Naruto. That place keeps getting worse and worse. He calmed himself before he spoke to avoid upsetting Hinata. Don't worry, you'll stay with us in the meantime. We're going to find a home where bad things like that don't happen to kids like you. She gasped and hugged him. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No sweat. Now, get some rest, and we can get out of here, far away from Kanoa. He then looked at the dead Kumo Shinobi. But first, a little something for whoever told him to do this. When the dead Kumo Nin was found a few days later, it looked like a rock slide had happened and crushed him. The wound from a blade looked to be done by accident in the fall. Hinata's body couldn't be found, but the bag was found snagged on a branch in a river downstream, implying her body was lost at sea. And since the death appeared to be an act of Kami rather than caused by Kanoha, Kumo couldn't make a demand for a Hyuga death, sparing Hizashi. The Hyugas were grateful, but spared no time or effort to confirm Hinata's death. After a long run and a boat ride from the southern edge of Land of Fire's coastline, Orochimaru and his charges had reached the Land of the Sea. He himself had set up a lab there to attempt some things away from Kanoha to ensure some secrets didn't leak out in case of spies plus some direct access to aquatic resources helped. He hadn't been there in years, so another researcher named Amachi had been running it in the meanwhile. Is this where we're gonna stay, Jazan? Anko asked as she got out of the boat. Orochimaru shook his head. Can't. This would be one of the first places they'd check for me. We're here to see just what was done while I was away. Then we'll head for our new home. Where is that? Karina I asked. I told you I'd tell you when we get there. Everyone got off the boat. Orochimaru and the two snakes led the five kids towards the hidden lab built by the shore, designed to look like a run-down building no one ever cared to renovate. At least on the surface, inside it was everything a laboratory was supposed to be. Orochimaru had made it that way himself, using the old, hiding-in-plain-sight principle to make it so unlikely to be bothered with. And even if someone did bother to try and sneak inside, there were workers already inside who could get rid of them. Orochimaru led everyone inside while carrying Hinata. The poor girl had barely walked at all since she came into his company, and he suspected it was more because of shock or fear than her injuries. She said even less too, but she at least smiled when everyone tried to lift her spirits. Orochimaru led them through the corridors into the building, a faint trail of light bulbs guiding him into the research center. None of the kids asked where they were going since he already explained it to them, but they started to feel something was wrong here. Orochimaru sensed nothing, well used to surroundings such as this from decades of ninjahood. He came to a closed door that wasn't locked, so he opened it and stepped inside. Right away, he wished he hadn't done that, to spare the children from the sight of the room's contents, if nothing else. There were large glass containers that looked like oversized test tubes lined against one side of the room, each but two with a person inside it. The ages and genders varied, and out of all of them, only one container had a glowing light on it. 
indicating something unique but not immediately obvious. There was also a table with various pieces of lab equipment and papers spread about. It looked like someone here had been doing some rather unorthodox human experimenting here, something the kids weren't supposed to see. What is this place? Karina I asked. This was a lab to see how we could improve our ninja's physical capabilities. Orochimaru answered. This wasn't what I was expecting, though. Especially that. Whatever that is. He then pointed to the glass tubes. Are they even alive? Yamado asked, having flashbacks to the experiments done on him for the past year and being the only one to walk away alive from it. Orochimaru carefully looked over each one. The one tank with the glowing light had a monitor that showed a faint heartbeat. He then noticed all the tanks had monitors too, but this one was the only one actually working. And judging by the size of the person inside, the test subject was a very young child, making the pale Sanin uneasy. This one is. I'm going to get her out of there. He checked everywhere for a latch of some kind, and found one near the top of the tank. He pulled it, and the liquid inside the container drained out, letting the captive inside sink to the bottom. Once it was drained, the glass casing opened up and Orochimaru pulled the small person out onto the floor. This test subject was indeed a young child, a girl close to Naruto and Hinata's age who couldn't possibly be more than half a year older at most. She had long purple hair and a pale complexion, but not albino-ish like Orochimaru. She also didn't have any clothes on so Orochimaru wrapped her in his jacket to keep her covered. In doing so, he saw a strange mark on her left shoulder that looked like three tomos inside a circle resembling a seal of some sort. Is she okay? Naruto asked. I think, but I'm not sure. Somebody did something weird to her. Ah, Orochimaru-sama. Nice to have you drop by. A new voice said from a door to the left of the one everyone had entered from. Orochimaru turned to see a thin man with white hair and a long nose standing in a lab coat with his hands behind his back. Amachi, what have you been doing here? Orochimaru asked. Why, exactly what you ordered me to do? trying to find new ways to enhance ninja physical skills and terrain adaptability. This is not what I had in mind. Orochimaru snapped, pointing to the glass tubes and the unconsciousness purple-haired girl. No, but it's even better. You see, I found a lost boy some time ago who has every unusual blood, with so much potential to be unleashed. Maybe even the first of a new Kekiai Genkai. Apparently, he can actually shape-shift during times of bloodlust or stress, and to make it even better, with the right method, his blood can give those powers to others as well. Amachi told Orochimaru. Orochimaru admitted to himself the idea was an interesting one, but something about this bothered him. And you experimented on children too? How could you? Amachi shrugged. Well, in order for it to work, the blood must be injected into the jugular, and if the subject survives the transfer, a mark appears there. For children the survival rate appears to be the highest, so I had to work with young ones. But I've been running kind of low so I'm glad you brought me some more. Now Orochimaru was mad. Don't even think about it. I'm trying to give these children a bright future, not one where others think less of them for whatever reason they have. Kogayaku and Sango got in front of the kids defensively and became anacondicized. Amachi was unintimidated. Don't you think they'd be better off with the gift I can give them? Think about it. A secondary source of chakra if the primary one runs dangerously low. And if the user gets close to death, a second stage is activated and the user gets the ability to transform into a second form, useful for terrain handling and combat purposes. What ninja wouldn't want that? You can't force this on to kids that don't want it. The Sanin replied. The researcher shrugged. They're children. They don't know what they want. I don't think I can let you keep doing this, Amachi. Orochimaru stated as he pulled out some explosive tags. He didn't light them since that might put the children in danger, but he did show them off. Guess I'll have to show you how effective my work can be. Amachi said as he swiftly pulled out a syringe and threw it at the group. Before anyone could block it, the needle struck Anko in her jugular, making her scream. Anko-chan. Everyone yelled as Orochimaru pulled the syringe out. Anko kept yelling and squirming on the floor. It hurts. It hurts. The beginnings of the curse mark started to form around the puncture wound like a burn. While they were distracted with Anko's agony, Amachi took the opportunity to get several more syringes and hit all the remaining children in the jugular with great aim. All of them fell screaming and writhing as their blood burned internally. Kogayaku and Sango wrapped around the long-nosed researcher and began constricting him tightly. Orochimaru stood in front of him. Why the hell did you do that? And while we're at it, how are you able to? Well, you needed to be convinced my work has value. As for how, well, 
I guess you and your snake friends were just too slow to do anything about it. Forgive us Orochimaru-sama. We were more focused on Anko-chan than the others for that brief moment. Sango said regretfully. I was at fault too for that. Amachi, tell me you have an antidote for this. Amachi tried to hold in a laugh, but failed and laughed loudly. Now why the hell would I create an antidote for a power-up? What do you think I am? Stupid. Orochimaru was really disgusted with this man. Long ago, he thought he was rather insightful and quite possibly capable of opening new frontiers for Kanoa's ninjas. Apparently that was true, but he used it for the wrong reasons. Had he been doing this to willing subjects or adults, Orochimaru might not have minded too much. In time, he would have probably used this procedure to give the village's shinobi an extra edge against their enemies. But the Sanin had several children under his care, and anybody who tried to hurt them was automatically an enemy. Kogayaku, Sango, finish him off. The two snakes hissed happily and tightened their grip on him more and more until he was crushed thinner than a used-up toothpaste tube. Orochimaru checked on all the kids at once, first noting they had stopped screaming, just breathing deeply, and to sleep. On each one of their neck bases was a curse mark, three tomos inside a circle. Even Naruto had one. Damn, I thought maybe the Kyuubi's chakra could filter it out of his system. Wonder why it didn't. Truth was, at this point of time all the Kyuubi's chakra could do for Naruto was heal physical wounds and nothing more. That would change as he got older, but for now to do more would be dangerous to his health. So the curse mark was there to stay. Orochimaru felt there was only one thing he could do here. With the two snakes' help, he pulled all the children, even the extra girl, back outside and went in to recover any info regarding this curse mark before setting the place on fire with explosive tags. He didn't see any of Amachi's assistants inside, and while that bothered him, he figured it was probably for the best. Less trouble to deal with. He then got them back on the boat and headed back for the mainland. Night came and Anko was the first to recover, sitting upright around a campfire. She looked around to see Orochimaru sitting on a log watching over them all with Kogayaku and Sango, and also the new girl who seemed to be awake already. What happened, Jazan? It's a long story, Anko-chan. I'll tell you when the others wake up too so I don't have to repeat it. Orochimaru told her, then offered her a piece of dango he bought in the last town. Want some? She eagerly took it, but ate slowly. Hi, I'm Isaribi. The new girl said to Anko. Sorry, you had to get the seal too. Seal? Anko asked, then her eyes darted to the mark on the other purple-headed girl's shoulder. Anko tenderly touched her shoulder and felt the flesh was soft and painful to touch, making her pull her fingers back and wince. What happened to me? Orochimaru sighed. I'm sorry, Anko-chan, but that man gave you something bad and I don't know how to get rid of it. H, how bad? Bad enough that some people could call you a monster for it. Anko shrugged. They already do that. What else is new? Well, according to what I've been reading, this mark gives you a chakra boost when you run low, but it means you're more likely to act violently when that happens. And there's a second stage involved if you almost die, giving you the ability to transform into some kind of creature when you need to. Orochimaru explained. Anko blinked in surprise. And there's nothing you can do about it? He shook his head. Maybe I can get Jiraiya to seal its effects but I haven't seen him in years so I can't promise that. Anko then looked over Naruto and the others, who started showing signs of waking up soon. Then I'll use it to defend my Otito. If I'm stuck with this, might as well give it a good use. Anko-chan I wouldn't. Orochimaru started to protest, then thought it over, and slowly nodded. If that's what you want. The others woke up and Orochimaru explained to them what happened and what they involuntarily acquired. Not surprisingly, they were unhappy, but they had the same thoughts about it as Anko did. Orochimaru hoped that they wouldn't come to regret this later on. About three weeks after leaving Kanoha, Orochimaru had finally reached his destination, a hidden underground chamber in Land of Rice Paddies. In that time, he had kept a careful eye on all the children with him, still upset at what had happened to them in Land of the Sea. The only reason it happened at all was because he hadn't been expecting it the first time, and he was occupied the next time. Another reason might be that the syringes Amachi used were designed like Saban needles more than standard syringes with automatic injection features built in. And he did always have great aim when it came to projectiles. Orochimaru cursed himself, wishing he had only been more prepared for the long-nosed researcher to actually try something. But he wasn't, and now all the kids in his care might suffer from it. So far he hadn't seen anything negative from what he dubbed the curse mark outside an occasional brief flash of pain. He wondered if that was meant to encourage the person to use it or just a nasty side effect. The scroll with all the info regarding it didn't say much about it. 
It did, however, come with several sealed-up samples of the blood-based formula used to give one the mark and abilities. Orochimaru kept it around in the hopes of someday reverse-engineering it and ridding the kids of it. Or at the very least, have a better understanding of how it works. For the time being, he ignored that and went inside the hideout. Since it was quite dark underground, he used a fire jutsu to light the candles left on the walls to illuminate the place better. This place reminds me of those haunted houses you see in movies. Kabuto stated. Why did we come here? Karinai asked, as darting around as if looking for something. A long time ago, me and my teammates found this abandoned place during an A-rank mission that was taking longer than we expected it to. We used it to hide ourselves and ambush our enemies. Afterwards, we agreed this would be our secure location to come to if we needed to go somewhere private. So only Jiraiya or Sonade would think to come here. The one adult present explained. Are they coming? Naruto asked, not knowing who they were or his connection to them. Orochimaru sadly sighed. No, they aren't. They don't know I'm here and I'd rather they don't find out yet. If I saw either of them soon I'd be very mad at them. How come? All the children asked. Orochimaru wasn't going to like this, but knew it needed to be done. Naruto, I wasn't supposed to be the one to watch over you all these years. Jiraiya and Tsunade were. Naruto looked surprised. Then why didn't they? Orochimaru shrugged. I'm not entirely sure. I personally think Jiraiya just didn't want to juggle you and his work so he chose his work first and Tsunade was more interested in doing her own thing than taking some responsibility. If they have other reasons I'd love to hear them, but that's all I can assume for now. Several of the kids frowned at hearing this, but Naruto just hung his head. You okay? Naruto? Said Blonde lifted his head showing off a grin, with some small tears in the corners of his eyes. I'm fine, Jazan. At least you're here for me. Always will, kid. You can count on it. How long we gonna be here? Hanada asked. Not too long. Just long enough for me to check up an old idea of mine and see if we can go ahead with it. Orochimaru told them with a grin, making them all feel better. Later that evening, Orochimaru was seated at an old desk looking over some old papers he brought with him, with some storage scrolls next to him as well. Anko, Karinai, Isoribi, Kabuto, and Yamado were currently looking around the place to get a better feel for it and make sure there were no unwelcome surprises there, with Kogayaka tagging along in case there were some. Hinata was currently taking a nap with Sango curled up to be the pillow, resting peacefully. Orochimaru was glad to see that since while the girl had been healing she kept having bad dreams, presumably about what had hurt her in the first place. Naruto was awake and trying to see what Orochimaru was interested in at the moment. What you doing, Jazan? Going over something I haven't in a long time. Like what? You probably wouldn't understand. It's boring grown-up stuff. The snake Sanin answered. Then why are you doing it if it's boring? Naruto innocently asked. Boring for you, not me. And hopefully, not the daimyo of this country either. Orochimaru corrected. Why? Let's just say that if he agrees with me, then we'll be secure for years to come. Orochimaru explained as best he could without revealing too much. I can't tell you more than that, sorry. Naruto looked upset but didn't argue, and decided to just pace around until the others returned. Excuse me, daimyo-sama, but you have some visitors. A guard at the place of the daimyo of Land of Rice Paddies told the ruler as he entered the throne room. Visitors? I'm not expecting anyone. Who are they? The ruler of the country asked. He was tall, thin, with brown hair beginning to gray, and a small beard, wearing a black royal kimono with a pattern for a rice farm sewn onto it. The one adult present claims to be one of the Sanin of Land of Fire. His physical description matches that of the snake summoner, and the fact that he is talking snakes with him adds to that confirmation. The daimyo rubbed his chin and thought. Interesting. A Sanin wishes to see me. Wonder what for. He then caught something else. Why did you say the one adult present? He has several children in his care daimyo-sama. Seven to be exact. The guard answered. Why would he bring children here? I don't know, but I feel that may be part of whatever he seeks an audience with over. The daimyo thought over it some more. Very well. Let them enter. Tell the guards they should keep watch but not overly hostile until any threat is apparent. The guard nodded and left the chamber. A moment later Orochimaru entered, followed by Naruto, Hinata, Isoribi, Anko, Karinai, Kabuto, Yamado, and the two snakes. San and San I presume? The ruler asked. Orochimaru nodded. My name is Orochimaru, for your convenience. If you don't mind, may I ask for you to remove your summons, as they may be viewed as a threat here. Orochimaru shook his head. That is non-negotiable, Daimyo-sama. 
These two are here to protect my two godchildren and their friends, and I'm not getting rid of their security while in new territory. As long as nobody moves to strike these children, you have nothing to fear from these two serpents. The daimyo seemed reluctant but later nodded. With that out of the way, to what do I owe the pleasure of this visit from one of the most esteemed shinobi in the known world? To be direct, I wish to start a hidden village here. The ruler flinched in surprise, never expecting to hear something like that. A hidden village? Here? Don't get me wrong. I've been hoping to get one started myself, so all the shinobi clans here have a place to live and practice their art. But why would you be interested in such a thing? Especially considering the San Nin are connected to Kanoha and Land of Fire. I've wiped my hands off that place, and wish to have a new home for those in my care. Kanoha is not fit for them. And since I'm more familiar with this country than any other, besides Land of Fire obviously, I could easily call this one my next home. Also, I don't think I could join a hidden village that already exists without alerting Kanoha to my presence and thus undoing all my efforts to guard these kids. Orochimaru explained. The daimyo looked confused. You make it sound like Kanoha is a threat to these kids. I find that hard to believe. Orochimaru gave a brief look over the kids, who looked up at him, staying silent as they had been told to do. He then turned back to the ruler of the country. Daimyo-sama, what would you do if I told you each one of these children, to some degree, some more than others, had their human rights violated? The daimyo looked mortified. Violated? Someone would do such a thing to children. He then took a deep breath and closed his eyes, recomposing himself, before opening them again and clasping his hands together. You have my attention. Now explain. Orochimaru grinned lightly, but then lost it as he began his story. Well, to start off lightly, a man named Danzo that I knew back in Kanoa helped fund research to improve shinobi abilities. Apparently that was a front for involuntarily subjecting orphans, and even kids with families if he could get away with it, to test and attempts to give them kekiai jenkais. Most did not survive, but I have three survivors here with me. Kabuto and Yamado raised their hands to indicate themselves, but Karina did not. He patted her on the shoulder though. This girl here so far was not actually used yet, but next in line for a test. As far as we can tell that is. It is possible he may have done something to her, and she blocked out the memory. Karina looked frightened now. Orochimara then got behind Aisiribi. This girl here was kept captive inside a glass tube in an island lab where a man I once thought of as a respectable colleague did the same thing as Danzo, just more specialized, making me suspect the two were in cahoots. Anyway, he forced a potentially lethal ability onto her, and did the same with all the children here. I wasn't expecting him to do something like that so I couldn't react quick enough to stop him. Pardon me, Orochimaru-sama. The daimyo interjected. Are you telling me all these children had a kekiai jenkai forced onto them? The Sanin nodded. How bad is this Kekiai Jenkai that's gotten you worked up? According to what I've looked over, it's not entirely without benefit, but also not without cost. Once acquired, the victim is in a lot of pain for several days, with the majority of the pain lasting only four minutes. After that, it's more like a pulled muscle that won't let you forget it's there. And it sort of enhances one's berserker tendencies when in a tight spot, meaning they may put themselves in unnecessarily risky situations. The Daimyo thought it over. Is that the worst of this? Because, forgive me if I'm wrong, this doesn't sound as tragic as you make it out to be. The older kids frowned at hearing this, but Orochimaru held out his arms. Settle down guys, he doesn't know the whole story yet. He then turned to look at the daimyo again. Well, onto a larger issue before I drop a bombshell, this girl here, indicating Hanada, was kidnapped from her home at night and for some reason village security couldn't stop it. He suspected that was his fault for setting two fires that night. I rescued her, and found signs of physical abuse from before the kidnapping took place. She doesn't like to talk about it, but from what I've heard her family is full of child beaters. The daimyo silently gasped and looked to Hinata for confirmation or denial. Her frightened, crying face trying to hide in the adult's leg said enough for him. And what else? You indicated something worse. Orochimaru sighed. Here's where Kanoha gets bad as a whole, daimyo-sama. You see, legally, I only have one godchild, this young girl indicating Anko, but since this boy's godparents, indicating Naruto, were too busy enjoying themselves to take responsibility for him, I volunteered to watch him until they decided to shape up and take responsibility. For three years, this young boy has been picked on by no less than 90% of Kanoa. I'd say 80%, but that would be giving them the benefit of the doubt, and I can't do that anymore. Sometimes kids get bullied by other kids. That's natural. The daimyo commented. Orochimaru narrowed his eyes. 
I didn't say he was victimized by just kids. I said the whole city. Adults too. If the daimyo had been holding anything just then, he would have dropped it. Adults? Bullying a three-year-old? Why? How? For how, they pretty much had an attack on sight mindset regarding him. They wouldn't kill him, probably because I got there in time to stop it. And when I was there, they would treat him like he was Cammy's biggest mistake, and sometimes my presence wouldn't deter them. I haven't left him unguarded by myself or one of these snakes in about two years because they'll take any chance to make him wish he was never born. There were times I did. Naruto quietly mumbled, but everyone heard it and the hurt in his voice. Hinata and Anko, the closest ones to him, hugged him to make him feel better. Isoribi wanted to, but didn't see any room for her to get a hold of him. Orochimaru stayed silent for a brief moment after that, but then continued. Anyway, the townspeople, mostly civilians but some shinobi too, several deemed honorable by the populace, took every chance they could to make Naruto's life hell. They did the same thing to my first godchild too, just because she's associated with him. And the adults in the village told their children to stay away from both of them or hurt them as much as possible, thinking kids could get away with what the parents couldn't. The daimyo scowled. And what possible explanation could they have for this atrocious behavior? I can't say it in front of the kids as they're not ready to handle that information yet. Orochimaru told him, then turned to the kids. If you all would like to go outside and see the courtyards for a moment you can now. They thanked him and went outside, with Kogayaku and Sango following. Before Orochimaru could speak up, the daimyo did. On second thought, it doesn't matter. There is no excuse good enough to justify what you've just told me. Daimyo-sama, what I'm about to say is Kanoa's deepest secret, one that's illegal to talk about. But since I'm not a Kanoha nin anymore, their laws don't apply to me so I can tell you, and the kids when they can handle it. You see, our previous Hokage sealed the rampaging QB no Kitsune inside the blonde boy and almost everyone holds him accountable for what the fox did three years ago. The daimyo's hands trembled in rage, and then he stood up and called for a messenger. Inform everyone that we will no longer hire Kanoha Shinobi for any work. If they ask why, tell them I've reason to question their rationality and say no more on the subject. The messenger nodded and left. So you'll help us? Orochimaru asked. Tell me more about your proposal for a new hidden village. The daimyo said with a grin. In a flat valley and land of rice paddies, construction began on a secret project. Well, that depends on how one defines the word secret. In one way, it was no secret at all, as anyone could see the construction taking place if they happened to be in the area. It was simply a new town being built to provide homes for a growing population and maybe provide more farmland too. Nothing out of the ordinary except some defensive walls and guarded passageways in and out of the area, but those were deemed needed to make it more secure until completion. But on the other hand, the reason of the construction, along with half of it, were completely unknown to anyone outside the country, and many inside it too. Yes, providing homes was a big part of why this town was being built. But these were homes for shinobi, and no one not involved would suspect a thing. And that was exactly what the planners wanted. Orochimaru and the daimyo of Land of Rice Paddies stood in front of a completed building looking over everything and their layout designs. The kids were back at the palace being watched over by the snakes and some trustworthy caretakers. So the San Nin was free to be away for the moment. Things are looking good so far. Aren't they Orochimaru-sama? The daimyo asked. He nodded, smiling. Yes, indeed they are. I'm glad I keep that little pet project of mine around now. Back when Orochimaru had been an academy student, one of the assignments had been for all the kids to design a hidden village if they were the ones who made it. His did well. But overall, none of the class had the right idea regarding what was essential for a hidden village. Some students had been frivolous and designed a metropolis design more fit for civil lanes, while others missed out on several details mandatory for making the village be considered hidden or operable. After the assignment was over, he kept the design with him and spent years trying to improve upon it, mostly to satisfy his own curiosity and creative urges. Now he had a chance to actually do something with the idea. He was no architect but a real one with shinobi experience would be proud of his concept. On the surface, the whole village would look like a completely normal civilian village. Walls would be around for defense against threats, both natural and man-made, but that wasn't suspicious since conflict was common and several civilian cities had that feature now. There would be suburbs, apartment complexes, hospitals, hotels, schools, dojos and gyms, parks, shopping centers, and entertainment centers. A casino and a public bathing area were added in too, 
as sort of an homage to the other two San Ni when Orochimaru initially worked on the design and saw no real reason to take them out. But under the surface, that was the beauty of all this. Underneath the city, and under the sewage system too, were secret chambers, bunkers, and hallways for shinobi to learn and train in. There was even a hidden academy and several training centers scattered everywhere, each designed to help in a particular area. Some in taijutsu, some in kinjutsu, some in ninjutsu, and some in jinjutsu. This way, the shinobi of this village could train to their heart's content without fear of someone from the outside ever finding them or even knowing what was going on. The dojos could be used too to get them used to training above ground, as long as they didn't use ninjutsu there. There was also an idea that the shinobi here only wear their hitaiate on the job, preferably out of town, rather than walk around in public so visitors wouldn't notice. With this in mind, it would be the one true hidden shinobi village, by virtue of being hidden in plain sight. The daimyo had been satisfied with the conceptual design and provided what he considered the perfect location for the village. A flat stretch of land big enough to hold Kanoha if it had to, surrounded by mountains to the north and northeast. A gorge with a rapid river bordered the complete west and a forest provided the remaining boundary. The mountains were not completely impassable, but a route being worked on would make it more convenient. A bridge was being constructed over the gorge and two routes were being paved through the forest. Since the village was not trying to look like a hidden shinobi village, they needed these routes to make it more believable. They were being made in a compass fashion to make them easier to monitor though should something go amiss. Construction might take some time since we aren't letting too many in on this. The daimyo commented. So far the only help they had were from construction companies and shinobi with masonry skills who intended to settle down here when finished. If we could let another village in on this, then maybe things can go faster and we could have a ready ally. Reasonable. But who? And do I really need to say Kanoha is not an option? Orochimaru responded. Of course not. I was thinking more along the lines of Taki, Hoshi, or Kusa. The daimyo told him. Orochimaru arched an eyebrow. Them rather than Suna or Kiri or something? Well, the five great shinobi villages might have a lot of power backing them, but the lesser ones are more likely to bond with a fellow small village. Allying ourselves with them will make forming alliances with other villages easier too. And they're eager for business since they're often overlooked by clients in favor of the bigger ones. The Sanin nodded. Maybe, but having one of the major villages help might be a good thing. Especially if we need the manpower against Kanoa. This time the daimyo arched an eyebrow. Do you intend to go to war with your old home? At the moment, no. However, if they happen to discover my group is here, Naruto Kuen and Anko chan in particular, I'm sure they will cause trouble over it. And I'd rather be prepared for the worst. Suna would be the best option as they're the closest. IWA a close second, but I'd rather not risk their involvement either if I can help it. Because of young Naruto, am I right? The daimyo asked, having been told about Naruto's heritage to explain his situation better. Yes. Until I'm certain of their overall attitude towards Minato, I can't verify if they would be a threat or not. Most likely they are since Minato did not die that long ago, and one could not ask without raising suspicions they would look into. It might be years before anyone can, Orochimaru stated. Reasonable, the daimyo mused. So shall we stick with Suna and maybe one or two of the smaller villages? Let's see how much we can do on our own first, the Sanin suggested. Besides, the underground network has to be completed first, and it's best if only our forces has a good feel for that area. What we really need are some established clans to settle down here. Maybe some civilians and their kids will be willing to learn to become shinobis, but some existing clans and Kekiai Jinkai will give us some credibility when we make ourselves known. Why not go around other places to find people and families that have nowhere to go? Not fugitives that would sell you out, but desperate people with something to prove and willing to settle down somewhere. You know, like you were when you came to me. Orochimaru thought about it and shrugged. Why not? Orochimaru later made it back to the palace and gathered the kids together. Okay, everyone, I'm going to be going on a trip for a bit to try and find us more allies. You all will be staying here, with Kogayaku and Sango watching over you with Daimyo-sama. Do as they say. Everyone nodded, and he handed Anko something that looked like a paper bomb. Hopefully nothing bad will happen, but just in case something does happen, put some blood on this. That'll summon Manda to protect you guys, but it'll only work once. Do not use it for anything short of an emergency, got it? Anko nodded and pocketed the paper. Good. I'll be back as soon as I can. Stay safe. With that, the snake Sanin left for parts unknown. So what do we do in the meantime? 
Kabuto asked after the adult who watched over them these past few weeks left. I guess we train. Any better ideas? Anko asked. Are you sure that's a good idea? Karina I wondered, gingerly touching her curse mark. Ever since they got it, the kids were afraid to train, thinking it would control them if they trained. We've got to learn to deal with it sooner or later. It's not like they're just going to vanish with soap and water, Naichan. Anko replied. And if anything happens, the rest can stop them, right? Naruto asked. Exactly, Otudo. Anko stated. Rather than keep up the discussion, Yamato just went right to doing push-ups, and Naruto, Hinata, and Aisuribi joined in. Anko joined too, and after a moment so did Kabuto and Karinai. Nothing bad happening so far regarding their marks. And hopefully it would stay that way. Orochimaru had been traveling for two days now, not entirely sure just where he should be going. He couldn't go right to an established ninja village and ask if anyone there wanted to move. Clans weren't allowed to do just up and do that for security reasons. And he couldn't go up to bandits and rogues making them offers since their very nature was based more on greed than loyalty. The best idea he had was going to civilian towns and asking if there were any families with shinobi potential that wanted to take the chance to use it. So now here he was, in a random town in Land of Fire, taking a break and having a drink before going out again. Why are so many ideas easier said than done? He asked himself. I've been trying to figure that out myself. Another guy's voice said behind him. Orochimaru immediately recognized it, and slowly turned around to see Jiraiya, along with Sanade and a brunette he didn't recognize. Oh, hi dope. What brings you here? That's my line team. Jiraiya told him. Orochimaru, we came to help out. That's what teammates do. Sanade said gently. A little late, don't you think? He paused to take another gulp. Hey Sanade, you actually took time off from your eternal binge to see me? I don't know if I should be flattered or worried. I heard from Sensei what happened and I got a hold of Sanade here. We figured you might want some friendly company. Jiraiya explained. Orochimaru arched an eyebrow. What exactly did Sensei say? In his words, Jiraiya cleared his throat. He said that you had a tragic lose and took it rather unwell and just vanished. He also told me to tell you that he hopes you'll come back when you can get yourself sorted out. Orochimaru glared. That's it. Word for word. Jiraiya nodded and Orochimaru clenched his fists. That is one of the most apathetic things I've ever heard. We're sorry for you, Orochi. Sanade butted in. We heard you lost your goddaughter and your work to some maniac. But you shouldn't take it out on Sensei or the village. And I wouldn't, if both had done more to help Anko-chan and Naruto instead of just Dash. Wait. Did you just say Naruto? Jiraiya asked, caught off guard. The snake Sanin nodded. Yeah, Minato's son. The kid you two were supposed to watch over but never did. Who did you think was watching over him all this time? The toad and slug Sanins exchanged a worried look before turning back to their teammate. M. Orochimaru. Sensei told me he was killed just after the ceiling. Couldn't handle the strain. Orochimaru wanted to puke, and it had nothing to do with the alcohol in his system. He told you Naruto died? Jiraiya nodded. Yeah, and then I told Tsunade. You mean, he didn't? Orochimaru shook his head. Nope, he's still alive. Not that Kanoha wants him to be. I faked his and my goddaughter's death so I could get them away from that child-beating shit stain of a village. Tsunade started to cry. My godson is alive? Can I please see him? Orochimaru thought about it. I'll let you two see him, under a few conditions. First, you can't breathe a word of what I'm doing to Saratobi, period. They nodded without a hint of protest, even Sanade's assistant. Second, you need to help me find some trustable ninjas and clans to make allies with and are able to move about, so I can protect the kids better. For the record, I learned that the current Mizukage is about to issue a Kekiai Jinkai purge of Kiri. More like some kind of genocide if you ask me. Jiraiya said quietly. Orochimaru smirked. Then if we get there first and offer them solace, we can get the people and numbers I need. Good, so let's head out tomorrow for Kiri but I want to see Naruto. Sanade protested. You waited three years, you can wait another week or so. I'm getting these shinobi first so Naruto won't be such a target anymore. You make it sound like horrible things have happened to him. Sanade's apprentice commented. The look on the pale Sanin's face disturbed them all. I'll tell you more about that tomorrow. That way none of you will be unable to sleep tonight. So, are you going to help me or not? The three Sanin along with Shizen had reached Land of Water, with no intention of staying there for long. They would get this little task over with, hopefully with good results, and go where they really wanted to be, land of rice patties and with Naruto. 
Jiraiya and Tsunade had heard what had happened in their absence and were ashamed of themselves, even though they were not entirely at fault for their absence. Still, that didn't make it any easier on their consciousnesses. When they woke up the morning after a chance reunion with Orochimaru, Jiraiya and Tsunade were all ears about what had happened to Naruto. Shizen was too, even though she never met the boy, just his mother through Tsunade. None of them liked what they heard. Flashback. Okay, Orochimaru, tell us everything you wouldn't last night about Minato's son. Tsunade demanded first thing in the morning. The three Sanin were seated in a hotel room at the moment on one of the beds. Well, where to start? Naruto's alive but has been hurt repeatedly his whole life. Since you two weren't there to watch over him, I took your place and just couldn't take it anymore and took him away from there. I faked his death to ensure no one could come after him. Why don't you give us the unsummarized version? Jiraiya asked. I will, but first, you two have some things I want you to tell me too. Orochimaru insisted. You first, Jiraiya. Even if Sensei told you Naruto has been dead all these years, why is it in three years you didn't stop to visit me in the village? Even to chat? If you had then you'd see the truth then. What excuse do you have for not doing that? Jiraiya tried to steal himself, but slumped and sighed wearily. I wish I could give you one, but I can't. You know I've never been one for visiting just for pleasantries. I just figured you were content in what you were doing and interrupting you just for a quick, hi, didn't seem worth it. One question though, if Sensei told us Naruto was dead, what has he been telling you about us? Nothing about Tsunade except he couldn't get a response from her, but he said you were prioritizing your work and personally felt Naruto was better off with me anyway. Orochimaru explained. Why would he lie so much? Shizen asked. Orochimaru shook his head slowly. I have no idea. He did several things to help Naruto out, but why would he set us up like this? I just wish I knew. I would have done something about it. Sonade said quietly, full of regret. There was little you could do that I couldn't Sonade, except heal him better. And with how he got hurt, he would have needed it. The snake Sanin mentioned. Sonade was afraid to ask how bad the damage was, but luckily she didn't have to. He's been burned, stabbed, cut, hit with rocks, punched, kicked, almost drowned, or thrown off buildings. All more than once, and all within the first three years of his life. Sonade teared up and buried her head in her knees. I've ever heard of anything so monstrous in my life, and I'm a veteran shinobi. That's it. I'm officially and completely severing all ties to Kanoa from here on out. I'm going to confront Sensei about this and most likely do the same thing. Jiraiya added forcefully. Inspiration struck Orochimaru just then. Actually, Jiraiya, I've got an idea for you. You see, I'm working on a certain project to help my kids and could probably use Sonade to check over them regularly. You can too, but maybe you could also play a part for our sensei. Let me guess, you want me to be a double agent? Jiraiya stated. Exactly. The snake Sanin answered. Whatever info you give sensei, you give us too. In this way, we can find out if Kanoa is doing anything suspicious. For example? Jiraiya asked for clarification. Well, like whether or not anyone's trying to find Naruto, or maybe they have hostile intentions towards the new hidden village. Anything that could prove more risk for Naruto later on. I agree. It's a good plan. Sonade claimed. Jiraiya sighed. All right, it won't be easy, but I'll try. But if I don't like what Sensei says when I ask why he lied, then the deal's off. Orochimaru nodded. Well, I think that's enough for now. I'm going to be heading towards Land of Water soon. Want to come along? In flashback. The trip had taken them a while, but they reached their destination. Jiraiya was infuriated the whole time while Sonade appeared downright depressed. Orochimaru had a good idea why for both. Jiraiya felt betrayed by Saratobi and pissed at himself for never taking the time to confront Naruto's status from someone else. Even if he did trust the old man, he probably should have confirmed this info with another. So much more could have been done on Naruto's behalf if Jiraiya had known he was alive. And as for Sonade, she felt like a failure to Minato and Kushina since she hadn't even tried to do anything after Jiraiya came to her with grim news three years ago. She had gone to great lengths to care for Dan's niece Shizen, but hadn't gone to be with Kushina when the due date was near and thus could have helped him as planned. Sonade felt just plain horrible over that. Finding their way to Kiri wasn't too hard for them, mostly because they had been there before for their own Chunin exams years ago. Not to mention the fog was a dead giveaway they were heading in the right direction. When they got to the edges of the village, they hid in some trees rather than just enter. Shizen was currently hiding in a small den in the ground they could get back to later. Jiraiya summoned two small toads. You two check out the area. 
Let me know if you spot anything hinting to killing a lot of the residents. The toads departed and entered the misty village. You sure it'll be that obvious? Sonade asked. You can't have whole clans be slaughtered and keep it a secret, Jiraiya commented. They waited for a while, but not as long as they initially expected when the toads came back. We saw a ton of people tied to posts being kept in some sort of prison yard, as if they were going to be executed. Most of them looked unconscious and none smelled dead, but we couldn't get close enough to confirm that with the guards around there. Jiraiya shared a look with his teammates. Not very discreet. I know this village has taken a turn towards being more vicious lately, but I figured they wouldn't make a spectacle out of something like this. Well, let's go see them ourselves and make them an offer. Orochimaru suggested. There are guards posted just so you know, so it won't be that simple. The toad told them. We've got our ways. Orochimaru commented with a grin. When the Sandine snuck towards the wall surrounding the prison yard, Sonade summoned two slugs and had them approach the nearest guards. Once the guards saw the gastropods, they spewed some non-lethal toxins at them, knocking them unconscious for about two hours. Sonade and her slugs repeated this one more time on another pair of guards to make their entry less noticeable. Once they felt confident, the three shinobi sneaked inside. There they saw numerous people of various ages and genders tied up like they were going to be crucified. Some of them even had blindfolds on, implying they had digitsus. They were even a few children, and at least one pregnant woman tied up here, showing that the current mizukage was completely apathetic to them all. None of them looked dead, but few of them even looked conscious now. Dear Kami, Sonade gasped. Why are they doing such a thing? For some reason, the mizukage began spreading anti-kekiai genkai propaganda here, claiming it's a crime of nature and a sign of demonic heritage. Considering I once heard that Kekiai Ginkais originated from Jinchurikis, I could understand that, but they've gone so far as to make it a witch hunt here. Personally, I believe that the Mizukage is intimidated by them all. Jiraiya quietly thought out loud. Well, I don't care about that. Let's see if they're willing to hear us out. Orochimaru stated. He then carefully and quietly approached one of the conscious prisoners, followed by his teammates. Who are you? What do you want? The prisoner quietly asked, more out of fear than anything else. This one was a man with a white shirt, a navy blue hakama, and no footwear on. His hair was blue-tinted black and cut really short. I'm here to make all you an offer. Take it, and you'll live like you always have been. Refuse, and you'll stay here. Orochimaru answered. What are you, a devil? Like I really have an option when it comes to that. Just what's in it for you? I'm creating a new hidden village, and hoping to find some people to live in it with skills to offer. I'm sure at least some people here would rather live there than die here. The snake Sanin told him. Wait, did you just say you could save us? A woman with long brown hair who looked like she was playing dead suddenly spoke up. The Sanin nodded. Please, take me and my daughter out of here. I don't want to die. A few other voices rose and announced their desires to flee, all keeping quiet to avoid unwanted attraction from the guards. Okay, we'll cut you all down from these posts. Those that want to escape with us get behind us and those that would rather stay here can. Fair enough. Jiraiya asked. There were no objections. With the help of some shadow clones, the Sanin were able to untie everyone in the prison yard. Apparently none of the captives decided it was better to remain in Kiri and risk delaying execution, so all 214 prisoners unanimously decided to become citizens of the newest shinobi village in the land of rice paddies. Far away enough to ensure their safety from Kiri's influence, and enough people to make the new village have a good start. Before the Sanin and the prisoners could escape the prison yard, some of the guards spotted them. Three guards with Kiri Katayatesh stood at the gate brandishing swords. What the hell is going on here? One of them shouted. The first prisoner the Sanin spoke to rushed over to these guards and activated his Kekiai Genkai. Apparently, he had one that made his skin become like armor, and he had some pin-up rage to release now. Covered entirely in his armor, he punched each one of them and broke their swords as they tried to strike him. His punches were like being hit with a hammer, making all three guards collapse. When done, he turned to face everyone else. We gotta hurry. No time to be sneaky about it. So let's just scram. With that, everyone ran out of there like a frightened herd of wildebeests. Sonade made sure to grab Shizen before they left her behind. More guards were alerted and tried to stop them, but those with active battle-ready Kekiai Genkais fought back mercilessly. Orochimaru had many snakes the size of giant anacondas defend them too. Tsunade had some slugs spray various venoms at their antagonizers. And Jiraiya had some small toads spit out oil to make pursuit difficult and to burn anyone unlucky enough to get covered in it. 
Oddly, at least one of the guards actually helped them out by showing them the best way out of the village. He was tall with a bandaged face and gray camouflage pants on, and he wielded a large black sword single-handedly. He was apparently one of the assigned shinobi who disagreed with the Mizukage's orders and didn't want to stay under his authority anymore. He was also probably one of the few who would join them that didn't actually have a Kekiai Jankai, but not the only one. A few normal people joined the escape too, fearing the Mizukage would target them later on for some reason. By the stroke of midnight, the three Sanin and over 200 people formerly of Kirigakir had reached the shore and got onto several ships already arranged for them to leave in. Before they could be pursued any further, Orochimaru had some sea snakes take care of anyone who might try to follow them to the mainland. As a result, they reached land of rice paddies undisturbed within four weeks. Once Jiraiya and Tsunade reached the palace of the emperor of land of rice paddies, they both had only one thought cross their minds. Where is Naruto? Orochimaru could tell this and felt he should just let them, but since Naruto was bound to be watched over by one of the two snakes, they couldn't just go up to him. So he had to let Sango, and maybe Kogayaka too, know about this before he told the daimyo anything. After checking a few major rooms, they stumbled upon a shallow pool in one of the yards of the palace and saw two children playing in the shallow end. One was a girl with short black hair that had a bluish tint to it, and the other was a boy that looked exactly like a young Minato with six whiskers. No question who that boy could possibly be. Naruto. Sanade shouted happily before she darted out to hug the boy she thought had been dead for three years. However, her path became blocked by an orange and black snake the size of a large boa. And it did not look pleased. Sango, stand down. These two can see him. Orochimaru told the snake. All right, sir, but I shall keep watch over him still. Sango stated. Orochimaru nodded, showing his two teammates they could proceed. Just remember guys, he's young and not used to strangers approaching him with good intentions. So you might want to restrain yourselves a bit for now. Sanade and Jiraiya tried to keep that in mind while they tepidly approached the pool. The kids obviously saw them and stopped playing to watch the new adults, who could now see the girl was a Hyuga. Hi, are you two Jazan's friends? Naruto asked with a polite smile. Sanade couldn't restrain herself any longer and reached out to hug him. She got into the pool and went right up to the young boy and enveloped him in a soft embrace, surprising both kids. Fortunately, neither screamed or anything like that. Sanade muttered something unintelligible, like she was trying to say several things at once to him. She loosened her hold on him when she felt him squirm, but she didn't let him go just yet. When she looked at his face, she saw he was worried, but not downright panicked. It's okay, Naruto. I'm Sanade. I'm like your grandmother. Naruto gasped. Really? He turned to Orochimaru for confirmation, which he gave, then back to Sanade. Bachan. Sanade happily cried at hearing him call her that, and she hugged him tighter and whispered something in his ear. Jiraiya leaned in, perched on the edge of the pool, and smiled warmly. Hey there, kid. I'm Jiraiya, and I guess that means I'm like your grandfather then. Eroji chan Naruto innocently asked, much to Sanade's amusement and Jiraiya's chagrin. Even Orochimaru chuckled at that. Guessing Sanade must have told the boy to call him that. And just where have you two been all this time? An irritable girl's voice sighed from the direction of the other side of the room. Everyone looked to see Anko standing by the doorway inside looking upset with her arms crossed in front of her. It looked like she had just recently shown up to hear this. Anko-chan, something wrong? Orochimaru asked carefully, having a good idea what was on her mind. Yes, there is Jazan. These two have been gone all this time, playing around like you said and now they think they can just go up to him and act like it's no big deal? What gives? Fortunately, the two visiting Sanin could tell this girl was just being protective of Naruto rather than downright telling them off, so they didn't overreact to her claim. Jiraiya stood up and looked at her gently. We would have helped him out, but the Hokage lied to us and told us he died years ago. Anko's eyebrows arched, but her expression didn't overall change. The old man who helped him out? Why would he do that? That's what I intend to find out. Jiraiya replied. But just so you know, if he didn't, me and Swanda here would have come back to Kanoha to care for him. Are you two married? The young purple-haired girl asked curiously. Both Sanin looked unsure how best to answer her, while the remaining one covered his grin with his hand. Actually, we're just friends and prefer things that way. Sanade managed to make herself say a bit later. And we're gonna be here for Naruto from now on. I have to take off one more thing first. Jiraiya added. I'll see you guys soon. I don't want to wait any more to hear what excuse he has for this. He then shoo-shined out of the palace. Wouldn't want to be sensei now. 
Orochimaru commented. Two days later, Saratobi was going through the paperwork at his desk when Jiraiya invited himself into the office. Jiraiya? This certainly is a surprise. Not as much as the one I got. The Toad Sanin commented. What do you mean? The old Hokage asked. Oh, I happened to bump into my old teammate not too long ago. I was surprised to see him away from the village and thought it was a good idea to look into it. Imagine my reaction when he told me why he left. Saratobi was perceptive enough to hear what wasn't actually being said here. I'm sure you've got some questions you want answered. No, I want to play golf. Of course I want answers. Jiraiya responded almost yelling, being sarcastic in the beginning then completely serious at the end. Let's start with the most obvious one. Why the heck did you lie to me like that? Saratobi paused to inhale from his pipe, making Jiraiya suspect he was buying time to phrase his explanation in an innocent way, more likely to cover his own ass. What would you have done if I hadn't? Saratobi asked him plainly. My duty. And neglect your spine network which has kept Kanoha well guarded these past few years? Wouldn't that have endangered Naruto and everyone else here in Kanoha? Saratobi asked. If I had been told the truth, I could have informed Sanade who would have come back here and watch over him when I couldn't, so I wouldn't have had to drop my work. And Orochimaru would still have been able to help. So all three Sanin could have watched over him rather than just one. What do you have to say to that? Jiraiya countered. Sanade would have had to focus her time at the hospital, and you know she might have drinked a lot in his company and that wouldn't have been a good idea. Saratobi stated. Personally, I'm amazed Orochimaru found as much time as he did for the boy, but you and Tsunade would have been more pressed with your jobs. Maybe you're right for me, but Tsunade would have more likely volunteered than taken a real job. And if anything, Naruto would have been a positive influence on her rather than her being a bad one to him. And if a child was raised and taught by multiple Sanin, he would have become a big target by this village's enemies. Naruto was already endangered by being Minato's son and I needed to keep him out of the spotlight as much as possible. Jiraiya snorted angrily. If that was true, then why did you allow knowledge of him being a Jinchuriki to be known to others? Saratobi looked curious. Just what did Orochimaru tell you? For that matter, why didn't you bring him here with you? This is between you and me, Sensei. And he told me everything, from the ceiling to the council and civilians trying to murder Naruto since literally day one. And here you've been telling me he's been dead all this time. Again, what gives? I told you. I needed to keep him out of our enemy's interest. Jiraiya narrowed his eyes. And yet you let him be in the line of danger here. Sounds like you felt someone was going to be hurt no matter what, and better it be Naruto alone than others with him. That's low sensei. He sighed and turned around. I need to be scarce for a bit sensei. Also, I don't think Sanade going to ever come back here without wanting to destroy something. Saratobi didn't look like he was going to argue against this. Hope you can understand things better once you think things over some and I hope you'll still come back at the designated time for your report. Jiraiya said nothing, just left the room. But before he left Kanoha, he had one more stop to make, although he would have to be careful with this part. After all, he couldn't exactly give away the source of his info. Jiraiya stopped in front of the Hyuga household and was greeted by the guards. What business do you have here? I'm Jiraiya of the Sanin, and I'd like to speak with the head of the Hyuga clan regarding some info I've acquired. The guards remained silent, but one agreed to his request and let him enter. Wait here. I'll go get them. Jiraiya waited and a few minutes later an unbranded Hyuga woman entered carrying a young infant. A girl judging from the pink blanket wrapped around it. Hello. I'm Hitomi Hyuga. Sorry my husband couldn't greet you, but he's busy at the moment. Judging from her shadowy eyes and rough voice, this woman was not well. So busy that someone who looks like they should be in a hospital needs to speak for them? Jiraiya thought. Now Hyuga-san, as you may know, I'm one of the Sanin, and I've got ears listening in many places. One of my sources says that some time ago, about a month, a Hyuga from the main branch was kidnapped by a Kumo Nin and declared dead. Is this true? Hitomi started crying and sat down. The baby in her arms started fussing, so she cooed to it to calm her down. Why? Yes, that's correct. That was my daughter Hanada. Hmm. Orochimaru told me he saved her, but the girl said this family was full of child beaters. She said her mother was nice, but dead. She must have been wrong about that part, but is she on the other? This was the main reason Jiraiya wanted to see the Hyugas while he was in Kanoha. Ma'am, that same source told me some rather unpleasant news. They said they saw the body, and before they destroyed it per ninja orders, they saw signs of abuse before the kidnap, implying that someone here hurt her physically, maybe more than once. Hitomi wanted to throw up at hearing this. The 
That can't be. Tell me, who all mourned for the girl when she was announced dead? Jiraiya asked. We all held a small ceremony for my daughter. Hitomi almost yelled. Outraged he would ask something like that. How many actually shed tears? Jiraiya asked. I. I don't remember. Hitomi answered, recalling many had dry eyes. Maybe even Hayashi did too, but she refused to believe that. I'm sorry if this bothers you, but I've got a reliable story that says this clan has child beaters in it. Jiraiya told her. Hitomi glared, then coughed before she could retort. And just what source is this? Jiraiya stood up and led her into a nearby washroom. He was sure no one would bother using the Byakugan to peek into an occupied room with a toilet in it, but he did activate a silencing jutsu. My source is the one watching over the victim herself. Hitomi gasped. Are you saying? He nodded. Yes, your daughter is still alive. She was saved by my teammate who has been watching her since. He won't bring her back since she says everyone here but her mother was mean to her. So I can't bring her here. She looked ready to cry a waterfall's worth of tears. But if you're up to it, I can take you to her. Problem is I can't promise you can just come back here. Or if you even should, considering you don't seem so fit now. I haven't been so good since my second birth. I had to be kept away for a few weeks, and at one point the doctors thought I already died. Hitomi explained. I can see why a three-year-old girl would conclude her mother was already dead then. The toad Sanin thought to himself. But. I've only recovered so much. The doctors don't think I have much longer anyway. The Huga matriarch confessed. Please sir, let me see my daughter one more time. Take me to her. Never mind my health. All right. Tell whoever you must you're going out of town to see a talented medic to treat you, and pack up any way you want with you. Oh, and bring the infant too. You'll understand if I prefer not leaving her with potential child abusers. Jiraiya told her, to which she agreed. A few minutes later Hayashi and the other Hugo were informed of her going on medic leave with Jiraiya's assistance. They were against the new heiress going along, but Hitomi argued that she would still be nursing the baby so this was for the best. Without further argument, in the approval of the Hokage, Jiraiya was on his way back to Land of Rice Paddies with two Hugas, riding Gamabunta to get there quicker. When Jiraiya showed up that night he was greeted by Sanade and Orochimaru. Gamabunta dispelled after his riders were on the ground. Suhaim, this woman needs medical care now. She's the Hyuga girl's mother. But Hanada-chan said she was dead. Orochimaru said. Not quite. But I sure feel like it some days. Hitomi answered wearily. Sanade did a quick diagnostic jutsu. Looks like someone gave you a slow-acting poison to kill you. When did this start? She didn't wait for an answer before she got started on the anti-venom jutsu best for this. I think after I gave birth to my second daughter Hanabi. Hitomi answered, feeling a sense of calm from the jutsu. Somebody must have wanted you dead but not immediately. Why? I haven't the foggiest. But this should clear things up. Just try not to stay active so soon. Sanade told her. Is my daughter Hanada here? Can I see her please? Hitomi pleaded. I'll take you to her. Orochimaru told her, leading her inside the palace. A teary reunion between mother and daughter, both thought deceased by the other, followed and was followed by a teary explanation of the physical harm forced onto said daughter by other relatives. Said mother decided not to return to Kanoha and would later be considered dead by natural causes in the Hyuga records, with Hanabi suffering SIDS at the same time. In time, the new hidden village was completed and ready to be inhabited. Orochimaru, who had been declared the ruler of the village, stood on an alcove on a central tower to address the new citizens of the village, both shinobi and civilians mixed together. Welcome everyone to this new shinobi village. I know we may not seem like much now, but we will soon become a respected force in the ninja world. Why? Because we'll have the elements of surprise and mystery better than any other. And because I'm sure this population will band together to help the rest rather than look for reasons to ostracize each other. Almost every head in the crowd nodded. So let us strive to be a grand village rather than a barbaric one, which I'm sure some of you will agree some of the major hidden villages have started becoming. Again some people nodded. Today a new village has been born. From here on out, this village's name will be Odegekir, the hidden sound village. The name was based on a set of cannons positioned at each of the gates around the village that fired off huge chakra-powered sound attacks at intruders. A fifth one was on top of the Kage Tower and could be fired in any direction if need be. Everyone cheered and hailed Orochimaru as the Shodei Modokich. After the first day being in the new village called Odo, the three Sanin gathered together with the kids in their care along with Hanada's mother. Orochimaru started the topic of discussion. Okay, 
We now have a place to call home and live safely. So now the issue is who lives with who and where. My daughters are staying with me. Hitomi claimed assertively, putting her arms around Hanada and Hanabi to emphasize her point. Thanks to Sanade's help, she was as healthy as a horse when by now she would have died for real. I don't think anyone was going to contest that. However, I do recommend that if you're going to live here rather than Kanoha, that you change your name so we can avoid any problems. Jiraiya told her. Hitomi nodded. Sounds fair. I think we'll go with the name Hibiki in honor of this new village. Hibiki means sound. Echo. Orochimaru smiled. I think that's quite an appropriate choice. But won't people see your connection to the Hugas just by looking at your eyes? I can wear contact lenses to cover that up, and so can my daughters when they're old enough. And maybe we can modify the Jukin enough so that others won't connect us that way either. Sounds good. Now, as for the other kids, I think we should. Sanade suggested. Me and Otudo will stay with Jazan then. Anko stated, cutting off the slug Sanin before she could say otherwise. Now, little girl. Jiraiya started. Anko gave him an angry look. No, old man. I know you and her are Naruto chan's grandparents, but you two were more interested in books and beer to notice him. Now you come here and want to act like it never happened? No way. My brother is staying with those I know will care for him. Orochimaru smiled at how fierce this child could be in the face of two Sani. Anko chan, you're going to be quite a force when you're older. He then cleared his throat to catch her attention. Actually, Anko chan, what my teammates were going to say is we all reside here in this tower. That way all you kids can be together and we all can watch over you. No fair splitting you guys up, is it? Or giving you random people to call parents now? Anko's temper deflated. Yes, Jazan. This will also help us keep an eye on those marks you all have now. Orochimaru added. Tsunade, Jiraiya, and Datomi had been more than appalled to hear about that little incident. Jiraiya tried to seal it up but couldn't undo it for reasons that escaped him. It was as if it was only part seal, part something else entirely. Sonade checked as well and her medic ninjutsu did nothing to improve it. If anything, her jutsus meant to calm it only aggravated it instead. What about Anata? Hitomi asked, since her oldest child had the curse mark too. There's enough room for the three of you as well. The carpenters sensed several people might reside in this tower, so there's enough room here for two dozen. Orochimaru answered. You really want to stay here? Just like that. Kabuto curiously asked. Hitomi nodded. You heard what Hinata went through. How could I make her go back to that? Or Hanabi either to maybe be their new target. Better I stay here and let them think I'm dead or something, even my husband. He wouldn't be able to hide this secret from the Hyuga Council. Yay. Hinata-chan staying with us. Naruto cutely cheered, making the adults and the mentioned girl grin. Later that night while everyone was asleep, Jiraiya was doing a quick check on Naruto's seal just a precaution to make sure no one had done any tampering with it without Orochimaru's knowledge. It was unlikely, but the snake Sanin wasn't as good with seals as the toad Sanin, and he couldn't have watched Naruto 24-7 for three years. So Orochimaru let him check it out, but he, Sanade, and Anko insisted on sticking around and watching, if nothing but to satisfy their own curiosity and protective sides. Jiraiya checked Naruto's sedated body over like a surgeon might. He noticed the curse mark darken and try to spread in the meantime, so he put a suppressor seal on it for the meantime. Hopefully it would last. But when he took a direct look at the seal for the QB, Jiraiya's vision darkened for a moment. When he could see again, he saw himself in front of a giant set of cage doors standing in shallow water. He noticed a piece of paper with the kanji for seal on it on the cage, and knew exactly where he was. Minato, did you plan this? Or am I here by accident? The pervy sage asked himself. The sound of breathing and groaning made him stop, and the sight of a large red eye slowly opening made him freeze. Who are you? A tired but strong voice asked him. Jiraiya was half tempted to give his trademark introduction, but wisely thought the better of it. I'm just checking up on the boy. I never expected to come across you. The QB shut its eye again and slowly reopened it, but not as much this time. If you're here to hurt the kid, you just made a big mistake. The fox growled, almost protectively. I'm here to help him. The last thing I want to do is hurt him. Hubie looked at him like it was studying him, and it appeared more alert and awake this time. How do you intend to help him? Since I'm in him, I'd be affected so I have the right to know. I just wanted to make sure the seal hasn't been tampered with or weakened in any way. Some idiots in Kanoha could have easily done that if they did anything to him without truly thinking it through. Jiraiya explained. The QB groaned, or maybe yawned. It was hard to tell here. Nothing like that I've seen. From what I recall, 
The seal was the only part of him those bastards and bitches left alone. Jiraiya blinked in surprise. From what you recall? I saw everything through his eyes. I can't do anything except heal him though, but only so much or he might get poisoned from my chakra. Otherwise, I'd have gotten rid of that new mark myself. That one's a bit of a nuisance. From what I can tell, it's some sort of false Kekiai Jinkai, giving him a unique ability, but it can't be passed down to his own kits. By the way, go easy on the sedatives, they're only making it worse for him. How? Jiraiya asked. I'm no expert like that vixen you're with, but the man who gave the kit that mark said being close to death would trigger a second stage for that mark. I think being heavily sedated for a time might be just as effective for it. Jiraiya thought this over. I'll take your word for it, since that thing is very confusing to me. I've been trying to understand it since the kit and the others got it. I believe it's some sort of secondary chakra source that first awakens in a dangerous situation. Maybe activating an already present Kekiai Jenkai will trigger it too, but I'm not sure. This kind of throw a wrench into my possible offer. The QB mentioned. Possible offer? Jiraiya repeated curiously. I might as well tell you anyway, since the kid's too young to understand. You see, the Bija, when sealed inside a human, can do something to help their host out and prolong their life. Usually, the creation of a Kekiai Jenkai, that's the source of them all. The QB explained. So that little tidbit I heard was right. Jiraiya quickly thought. The QB continued explaining. The way it works is based on the host's age and the number of our tails. Take the Achibi, for example. He can offer a single Kekiai Jenkai to his host, but it has to be done before the first birthday or else all he gets is extra chakra and quick healing. Since a human that young can't understand the situation, the Achibi usually chooses the Kekiai Jinkai for them, and it's always sand-wielding. So you can give Naruto a Kekiai Jinkai to make him a better ninja when he's older? Jiraiya asked, and QB nodded. But Naruto's three, going on four. Isn't he too old for you to do that? If I was the Achibi, or anything weaker than the Sambai, then yes. But I have until he's nine years old, since I have nine tails. And what's more, I can give him nine Kekiai Genkai's total, either already existing or completely original. All he has to do is decide which ones he wants, and I can give them to him. Jiraiya gasped. Nine Kekiai Genkai? How could anyone possibly handle that? He can't use them all at once. And if he were to reproduce when he's using one of them, it would be passed down to his own kits. He'll basically be a Kekiai Jinkai factory and need nine mates when he's old enough. Jiraiya paled. In. Nine-wa. Women. I never thought I'd envy a three-year-old before. Then he thought of something unperverted. Wait. What do you get out of this? Two things. One. That he won't die anytime soon. The host's death hurts the Bija too, and it hurts like hell every time. And two. When he finally does die, if he accepts the offer, then I don't die with him, but get to return home. Otherwise our lives become permanently linked. Haven't you ever wondered why everyone says when a Jinchuriki dies, the Bija does too? But all nine of us are still alive when there have been Jinchuriki in the past? Jiraiya went over all this newly gathered info quietly. When he opened his eyes, he found himself back outside the seal in the room with the others, laying on his back with everyone but Naruto gathered above him. Em, um, how long was I out? A few minutes. Did something happen? Sonate answered. Jiraiya sat up and popped his back. Yeah. I ended up talking to the fox somehow, and heard something rather interesting. Like what? Anko asked. Well? Jiraiya started. Crap, how can I explain this to a kid? After thinking of the best way to phrase it, he answered her. Let's just say Naruto here, when older, is going to be very strong and needs several girlfriends. Anko smiled, but Sonate scowled. You better not be planning on making him a pervert. Anko-chan, why don't you leave the room for a bit so the grown-ups can talk about this? Orochimaru suggested. The purple-haired girl got the hint and left the room, but hung outside the door to eavesdrop. I know you're still there, Anko-chan. Thus she sighed in defeat and walked away. Now what's this about several girlfriends? Sonate asked hostily, with the beginning signs of fire in her eyes. I know this is hard for you to believe, Haim, but the QB told me that when Naruto here turns nine, he can create nine Kekiai Jenkai for him to have, and he can pass one down to each of his children. So nine wives would help him out, unless you'd rather one girl have nine children. Jiraiya explained. Sonate blanched, while Orochimaru grinned. He can create his own Kekiai Jenkai? Jiraiya nodded. Or he can assume one that already exists or went extinct. He can only use one at a time though, and each kid of his can only inherit one. I'm not sure what the case would be if the mother has one too though. Orochimaru's grin widened. This is perfect. 
I know we already brought in some Kekiai Jankais, but an opportunity like this is like a godsend. Think about it. We can either help out a thinning bloodline or make one that none of our enemies have ever heard of. Hell, we may even be able to improve already existing ones. Calm down, team. None of this can happen until he's nine. Jiraiya pointed out. I know. So we've got six years to help Naruto come up with nine abilities. Oh, the possibilities. I think we just got a great trump card against Kanoha. Orochimaru claimed. And I know I'm overpowering Naruto too much, as many fix tend to do, but I decided to try out a harem FIC, and I wanted a reason less cliche than the CRA. I've already got a few good ideas for some bloodlines and most of the girls, but I'm not finished for both lists. If anyone wants to offer a few ideas for girls or bloodlines, leave them in a review. I'll keep the bloodlines a mystery, but here are the girls already selected. Hanada, Isoribi, Kin, Sasami, Femhaku, and Hanabi. Tayuya, Tamari, and Shizun are good too if readers want. But Anko and Karinai won't be options. I've already got plans for them. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content. Click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.